Now, in other news, Iran has summoned the British ambassador in Tehran over the seizure of an oil tanker by the Gibraltarian authorities with the help of British Royal Marine Commandos. The Marines flew to Gibraltar overnight in order to lead the operation to board the tanker, which is suspected of breaking EU sanctions by taking crude oil to Syria. Well, the chief minister of Gibraltar spoke earlier on about the incident. Early hours of this morning, Gibraltar port and law enforcement agencies, assisted by a detachment of Royal Marines, boarded a supertanker carrying crude oil to Syria. We have detained the vessel and its cargo. This action arose from information giving the Gibraltar government reasonable grounds to believe that the vessel, the Grace One, was acting in breach of European Union sanctions against Syria. In fact, we have reason to believe that the Grace One was carrying its shipment of crude oil to the Banyas refinery in Syria. That refinery is the property of an entity that is subject to European Union sanctions against Syria. Uh, let's talk now to our defence and diplomatic correspondent, Jonathan Marcus. Um, what led to British Marines being flown out to Gibraltar to take part in this boarding operation? Well, all the indications are, and certainly we have this from a senior Spanish official, uh, that the uh, tip-off, the intelligence, if you like, came from the Americans. Uh, and that probably is one of the reasons why the Iranians are so angry. Uh, as you heard there, the uh, ostensible reason for seizing the vessel, the legal reason for seizing it, is the belief that it was heading to Syria. Uh, Syria has been under European Union sanctions since at least 2011. Uh, many of those relate to uh, elements of its oil and petroleum industry. Uh, the belief was that this was heading to a refinery which was owned by one of the uh, sanctioned uh, entities. But it is, of course, apparently the first time uh, a European European Union country has seized a, a vessel in this way and the Iranians I think are very angry they've called in the British ambassador in Tehran summoned him uh, and certainly it looks as though they probably believe that this is much more uh, an, an element of what they see as the American maximum pressure campaign to force them uh, into a new nuclear deal the Americans of course having walked away from the existing one and it comes at a time when relations when, between Britain and Iran are already pretty bad, the imprisonment of Nazanin Zaghari, Ratcliffe and so on. Well, absolutely. And of course, there are particular tensions between Britain and Iran and indeed the European Union generally and Iran uh, over this nuclear deal. Uh, in essence, what the Iranians are saying to the Europeans is uh, we want to stay in the nuclear deal. Uh, but we're suffering under the American sanctions pressure. You've got to take action to relieve that pressure, to improve trade uh, between your companies uh, and Tehran. Uh, the Europeans are making uh, a, 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 an effort in a sense to do that, but none of the experts I speak to believe that there is any way the Europeans can really address uh, the pressure, particularly on uh, the oil industry. Now another set of uh, the Iranians have al already uh, uh, broken one uh, limit uh, set by that nuclear agreement a few days ago. They're threatening to break more of its terms uh, this coming Sunday. And so I think this crisis has to be seen very much in that context. The Iranians are very cross. They're trying to send a clear message to to the Europeans, time is running out to save this agreement. You, the Europeans, have to do more to relieve the economic pressure. Jonathan Marcus, thank you very much indeed. We can go to Gibraltar now and speak to Jonathan Sacramento, who news editor of the Gibraltar Broadcasting Corporation. And uh, tell us a bit more, if you could, Jonathan, about this extraordinary operation involving British Royal Marine Commandos to, to board this, uh, this oil tanker. Yes, indeed. Well, the uh, uh, the Royal Marines, as you say, have been involved, but uh, the Gibraltar government says that um, it's been um, in charge of the operation and has been leading on, on the operation since uh, the beginning, since it started uh, in the early hours of the morning, and the uh, operation at sea itself has been carried out or has been led by the Royal Gibraltar Police in conjunction with law enforcement agencies such as uh, Customs, uh, such as the Port Authority uh, and of course the Gibraltar Defence Police. And what exactly happened? Um, the, the security forces, they, they, they flew over I gather, flew over the super tanker and landed from a helicopter. Uh, the Royal Marines did. Uh, the uh, Royal Gibraltar Police and the Gibraltar Defence Police uh, approached the vessel uh, by sea uh, on board two of the local law enforcement vessels. Uh, it is understood that the Royal Marines were deployed 
onto the vessel uh, via uh, what is known as a fast rope from the, uh, from the helicopter. Uh, and one Royal Gibraltar Police uh, officer, senior officer, we understand, just seconds after the Royal Marines landed on board the vessel, uh, also was also airlifted from the Royal Gibraltar Police vessel, Sir Adrian Johns, uh, onto the uh, deck of the um, onto onto the Grace One. And a pretty unusual operation, generally, and it's obviously caused quite an international incident. Iran is absolutely furious with what happened. Yes, indeed. Uh, uh, that's what we hear from the international news. Of course, uh, I'm a, a local broadcaster and I could tell you about what's happening here on the ground. But uh, um, I, I, as regards, of course, uh, Iran and the diplomatic uh, fallout from it, uh, I think that's, uh, that's not something I can possibly comment on. Yeah. All right. Good to talk to you. Thank you very much. Jonathan Sacramento there from the Gibraltar Broadcasting Corporation. Well, joining me to discuss this is Professor George Joffe, Middle East Specialist at the School of Oriental and African Studies. He's live uh, from North London. Thank you for being with us. It sounds like Britain has uh, wandered into uh, one heck of a diplomatic incident here. Well, I think it's almost inevitable because given our relationship with the United States and given, too, the way in which Britain is determined to push forward the sanctions regime, we are bound to intervene. The real problem, though, is going to be with Spain. Uh, yes, and tell us more about your take on that. Well, the problem there is if you know the area around Gibraltar, uh, getting into Gibraltar Harbour is extremely difficult because it's an enclave surrounded by Spanish territory. And that means that almost inevitably a super tank of the kind this was will have int intruded on Spanish territorial waters. Now, we don't know whether the Spaniards gave their permission it seems from the statements from the Spanish Foreign Ministry they didn't. And that means they're going to be very resentful of what Britain may have done. Because it puts them in, in an awkward position in their own uh, international relations, you mean? Yes, indeed it does. Uh, don't forget that uh, the U European Union is part of the uh, Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, which was designed to limit Iran's abilities to produce a nuclear weapon. Iran believes it's abided by that without any failure at all until very recently. And it blames the United States for having tried to impede unreasonably from its point of view, its exports of oil particularly. And now for this to have occurred is a slap in the face at a time when people are trying to find ways in which in some way Iran and the United States can be brought together. But presumably the position for Spain is similar to that of Britain and other EU members, which is to try and clarify that their role in this is all to do with Syria and not Iran itself. I'm sure the Spaniards would like to use that excuse. But their real problem is that they will argue that Spanish territorial waters were uh, intervened by Britain without any reason or explanation given to them. And they weren't necessarily the people approached by the United States to be asked if they would actually impede the, the tank from moving on. I think it's going to cause a real problem. Spain's always been very sensitive over the question of Gibraltar, and this is not going to help the matter at all. Mm. So it's essentially a very complicated situation. You already mentioned the United States, uh, and of course much being made of the fact that their intervention is far more bound up with Iran itself than the destination of this oil, Syria. That's quite correct. Their real concern is to stop Iran from exporting oil. Uh, Iranian oil exports have dropped from 2.1 million barrels of oil a day down as low now as half a million barrels. And that's a catastrophe in terms, in terms of the situation inside Iran itself, where inflation is taking off, where there's a real crisis over supplies, and the Iranian government is getting increasingly angry. And just a final thought, of course, all of this then playing into what is becoming a pretty immense power struggle between the US and Iran. Well, that's been going on for a long time. And don't forget, the United States is supported not only by the Gulf states, but by Israel, too, over this. Uh, and they believe that they can force Iran to change its policies. I think they're quite wrong. What's really going to happen is the Iranians are going to get increasingly irritated and opportunities for some kind of negotiated solution are going to decline very rapidly now. Dr. George Joffe from SOAS, thank you very much indeed for your time this evening. You're welcome.
This is BBC News. I'm Chris Rogers. The headlines at 8. A British flagged oil tanker has been seized by Iran's Revolutionary Guards, according to Iranian state television. Iranian media says it was captured in the Strait of Hormuz for breaking international maritime rules. The Foreign Office says it's urgently seeking further information. Good evening. Well, we start with our breaking news. Iran says it seized a British flagged oil tanker in the Gulf. The owners of the Stina Impero, which was heading to Saudi Arabia, say they've been unable to contact the vessel and it's now heading north towards Iran. The company says the ship was approached by unidentified small boats and a helicopter in the Strait of Hormuz, uh, which is a busy shipping lane for oil tankers. Well, uh, there are more than 20 people on board, we understand, and the Foreign Office is saying it is urgently looking into the reports. And the uh, government's Emergency Cobra uh, Committee is meeting in Whitehall. Now, this development comes amid heightened tensions between the UK and Iran. Our defence correspondent, Jonathan Beale, uh, has been explaining a bit more. Well, we've been able to track where that tanker was going. It was moving from Fajera and the Emirates. It was going up the Strait of Hormuz on its way, we believe, to Saudi Arabia, when it was, uh, in the words of the company that owns this, it was intercepted by unidentified small craft, a helicopter also in the air. And now we have this confirmation from the Iranian Revolutionary Guard saying uh, that they have seized, uh, have captured a British oil tanker, the Stena Impero. Uh, they say uh, they seized it because it was not following international maritime regulations and other Iranian ports saying it was causing problems. So I think the presentation from Iran is that it was, it was, it was inside their territorial waters. Um, it wasn't following maritime regulations. I think you've got to treat that with a, with a pinch of salt because we know full well that Ir Iran has said it would seize a British tanker in retaliation for what happened off the coast of Gibraltar earlier this month when an Iranian tanker was seized involving Royal Marines and is still being held there. Uh, in fact, the, there's been an extension holding Grace One, this tanker, off Gibraltar for another 30 days. But they've been clear about retaliation, and this seems it. In a, in a way, I, I mean, it's not that surprising, is it? It's not just about that tanker Grace One that you're talking about being seized on Gibraltar. The, even before then, tensions were rising between the UK and Iran and the US and Iran over uh, the sanctions um, that um, were, were, were imposed after Donald Trump decided that, uh, you know, they, yeah, he wasn't indeed. convinced they were, they were enriching uranium. Yeah, indeed. But, I mean, that really was a dispute between Iran and the US. And, of course, Britain is viewed in, in sort of throughout history by Iran as, as the little Satan, whereas America is the big Satan. But, you know, Britain has been, with the rest of the EU, um, supporting the Iranian nuclear deal, unlike America. They haven't pulled out of that. What's really triggered this as far as, you know, why target a British tanker is what happened off the coast of Gibraltar, I think. And, you know, there will be questions now, clearly, about, you know, there's one British warship we know in the region at the moment, a second going to that region. We know that HMS Montrose, a frigate, um, was involved in an incident earlier this month again after the seizure of that uh, tanker off Gibraltar. And it had to come to the aid of another British tanker off the Strait of Hormuz. Warning, warnings were given over the radio for the Iranian Revolutionary Guard to stay clear. Uh, and that tanker got, got away to safety. But this time, um, it just seems that HMS Montrose, which, to be honest, you know, one ship trying to patrol that whole area where there are about 30 ships on any given day, British ships, um, tankers, vessels that may be carrying stuff to, that, that is going to Britain. It, you know, it's a hard job to keep an eye on all those with just one warship. And clearly, in this incident, it doesn't seem, and we haven't got confirmation from the MOD on this, that HMS Montrose was in the immediate vicinity, though she certainly was at sea at the time. Jonathan Beale, our correspondent, uh, speaks to me earlier. Let's now get some reaction from the former First Sea Lord, Lord West. Uh, good evening to you, Lord West. Thank you for joining us. Just picking up on our correspondent's uh, information there, that there appears to be one naval ship in this area protecting goodness knows how many tankers and, and other cargo vessels. That's clearly not enough. I'm no expert. 
No, absolutely. I mean, I'm afraid we have got a desperate shortage of escort vessels in the Royal Navy, and a number of us have been banging on about that for a few years now. Um, to have one frigate in the Gulf, when it's such an important area for us, where tension was rising anyway, um, I find extraordinary. I'd have thought we'd have moved something else into the Indian Ocean, at least, if even if not into the Gulf, some probably some weeks ago, a couple, two or three weeks ago. As it is, HMS Duncan is on her way out there to stand in for Montrose while she's doing some repair work in Bahrain. But then she'll be the only ship in there. When Montrose is repaired, you've got two ships there. That, that is unsatisfactory. But my biggest concern, I have to say, is I find it extraordinary that British-flagged ships, tankers particularly, are steaming on their own into this area of danger. I would have thought that after the uh, thwarted attack on a tanker, which was thwarted by Montrose, we would have put in place some sort of control of British flagged shipping, holding it clear of the area until we were ready to escort it through. And I find it absolutely extraordinary that it appears this ship was allowed to be proceeding on its own. Is there not a danger, though, that if you send more naval frigates into the area, you only serve to increase tensions? The last thing Donald Trump, or our Prime Minister, whoever that is at the moment, um, wants is, is war with Iran. Well, absolutely, but the, I think greater tension is if we find they start capturing Red Ensign ship after Red Ensign ship and holding the crews hostage. I and mean, that is not a policy for a country to follow. I mean, you cannot allow that to happen. We've got to protect our ships and our people. Sorry if I'm being naive. Is, is there not another route uh, to avoid all those tensions that, that could be taken? Well, I mean, I think we should be trying to de-escalate, but you can't mm. allow thugs and, uh, and, and, and effectively criminal actions by a nation against your nation. Mm. Um, that's a recipe for appeasement, isn't it? And goodness knows what you let people get away with if you do that. They think they can do anything. I'm afraid the Iranians have a track record of, of breaking uh, international rules and doing these things. Unfortunately, the reason we've got to where we are is because of the breakdown in the agreement that was allowing Iran to actually do some exports. Mm -hmm. They are really hurting now because Trump has ceased uh, recognizing that agreement. And they are casting around and thrashing around to try and show, look, if you don't come up with the goods and try and have some agreement with us to let us to let us export things, we are able to stop and cut your, your um, trade routes. And, and I'm afraid that's why this has happened. But it doesn't mean you mustn't look after your own ship and your own people. Mm. I, I mean, just, just bearing in mind there isn't a free press in Iran, um, can I just read you um, a, a press release from Iran's Tasnim news agency, um, which says that the tanker, the Sen Impera tanker, was seized for not observing three regulations. The British tanker had shut down its GPS system, contrary to international marine laws and regulations, and instead of passing through the entranceway in the Strait of Hormuz, the Persian Gulf, it was going through the exit, which could have caused accidents with other vessels. Uh, it said that uh, it's also um, been seized because the tanker had ignored warnings by Iran. So they're saying um, well, it's got, I, it's got I, nothing I, to do with I mean, the fact that one of their tankers has been seized by Britain yeah. in I Gibraltar. Mean, I, mean, I mean, basically, they have a track record of saying things that are complete lies. So mm. uh, that would be my initial uh, view of what they're saying. I don't know whether any of those things happened. Mm. Um, I imagine they might have not wanted to follow warnings when they were surrounded by craft heading towards them. I just, I just don't know. Mm -hmm. But there is a track record of lies. This fits in with a pattern. You know, they tried to stop a ship when it was stopped by Montrose. Um, they said very firmly, we're going to do something because you um, captured that uh, tanker off uh, Gibraltar. We are going to get something of yours. They made it very clear they're going to do it. And, th and they, will, they will just lie. I mean, they will lie about why and what they've done. But the bottom line is they want to get a, a red uh, duster ship in their hands, which they will then use as leverage. We know they like having hostages. They did the same to the Americans from their embassy years ago, they, you know, people like Zidane, Radcliffe, and things like this. This is the way they operate, and we shouldn't allow them to do that. So, I, as I say, I am horrified. There, there are only normally about 10 or 12, actually, Red Ensign flagged merchant ships going in and out of the Gulf. It's, there are a mass of other nations, but of the British ones, and I would have thought, with some sort of control of our shipping, we would have sorted that out. And I'm quite shocked that a ship on its own was going up through what are 
clearly now dangerous waters. And I hope we're not sending any more tankers through there without anyone looking after them. Lord West, fascinating. Thank you for speaking to BBC News. Um, let's uh, just uh, get some more analysis now. Uh, with me is Majid Ashfar from uh, BBC Persian. Um, well, I mean, if you believe what Iran is saying, um, it was in breach of three maritime regulations. Um, but when you listen to the likes of Lord West and um, indeed the, the British government and the American governments tonight, um, Iran's just turned on the pressure on the UK in, in, in what is, seems to be a tit-for-tat movement on, because of the seizure of one of their tankers, which we believe was heading to Syria. And on top of the reasons they say they, they're now saying it was polluting the environment, in, in the, while this is, a, this is quite a new um, tanker, it was built okay. oh, last year. You've got some insight into their thinking. What, why would they release a statement like that saying it was in breach of maritime laws? Why don't they just come out and say, well, if you're going to take one of our tankers, no, we're going to take one of yours? Why, 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 why not, don't they do that? They're not going to say that because they say, the, the Iranian leader, if you listen to Iran, Iranian leader who was speaking a few days ago, he was saying the vicious British seized one of our tankers in Gibraltar on behalf of the Americans. That's what they believe. They mm -hmm. think that the Americans ordered the, the seizure of that tanker and it wasn't the British who wanted to do that. And they knew that, that that tanker was not actually, the documents showed that it was going to Syria, but it wasn't actually going to Syria. It was going somewhere else. It was bound for somewhere else. So they see it as, as, a, as a British thing and they, they had said that openly that they would take revenge for this. They would retaliate this. The Iranian president said that, the Iranian foreign minister said that, and the Iranian leader in his last statement uh, said that very openly and, and quite in a, in, a, in a quite open way. It, it was quite unprecedented from him to, to, to talk like that. But, um, but as you know, we, we read the news today that the Iranian tanker, I mean, they, they were hoping that, that the British and, and Gibraltar officials would release the Grace oil one. tanker, yeah. The, yeah, Grace One, and they were they were really hoping it would it would happen soon, and there were indications that that would happen. But today we heard the news that no, this is not happening, and they have extended that uh, thing. And so it's 30 more days. Now they they step up. There are now even reports of a second tanker. We're not sure about that. It's not confirmed, but Iranian uh, uh, news agencies are now saying that. We, we but don't know which. Second tanker that's been seen. It, it's the Iranian news agencies mm -hmm. saying that. We're not sure about yeah. that yet, but. It takes time to, to confirm and, and, and see what has been happening. But as you know, tensions are quite high there. And with, with what we've seen last night with the, with the Iranian drone being shot down, they deny it. You don't know. So th there is this war of war, this rhetoric going on, which you cannot somehow confirm from, from any of the sides. How, how are they likely to react if there is a larger British even American naval presence in the Gulf to protect these tankers? I guess the, 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 the US and the British presence in the region is the biggest since the Iran-Iraq war three decades ago. So the, 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 especially the Americans have beefed up their the, the military presence there. They now call, they're now calling for a coalition of, of uh, warships to escort their um, their, their oil tankers there because because they know that they, they, they don't have security there. If you take a look at the the, the, the route that this uh, tanker today was was taking, we see that it it, it nears the Larak Island, which is the where the, the corridor to to Iranian waters, and that's where it changes its its uh, its. It's, you know, it's route. And all the tankers we've seen, Rhea, which was uh, seized last week, but then Iranians announced it like yesterday. And they have come up with, with different explanations on that. Once they said, oh, you know, it was, uh, it was out of um, order. They had problems. We went there, mechanical problems. We went there. And then they said, no, it was a smuggling some oil. So they come up with all types of explanations and, 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 um, and these, there, there's no way to verify whether, whether these uh, things are, are true or not. Majid, um, do keep us up to date. Uh, many thanks for speaking to us uh, for now. Uh, there has been uh, a statement uh, regarding the uh, Iranian seizure of a British tanker from the National Security Council in America. They say we are aware of reports that Iranian forces have seized a British oil tanker. This is the second time in just over a week the UK has been the target of escalatory violence by the Iranian regime. The United States will continue to work with our allies and partners to defend our security and interests against Iran's 
malign behaviour. Uh, so that from the National Security Council. Uh, calls tonight for more protection for British interests in the Gulf as tensions certainly do seem to be rising between the United Kingdom, the USA uh, and Iran. Uh, we're going to find out how this story uh, and many others of course uh, are covered in tomorrow's front pages. Uh, newsrooms around the country will be uh, scrambling around to, to get that uh, into the final editions or the first editions tonight. Um, so uh, we'll see how they get on by about 10.40. That's our first review of the papers. Then 11.30 this evening. And our guests uh, joining me tonight are the Mirror's Head of Politics, Jason Biatti, and former Conservative advisor, Mo Hussein. Do join us. We're just returning to our breaking news. A British flagged oil tank has been seized by the Iranian Revolutionary Guards. The British government is in a COBRA uh, committee emergency meeting. Um, we are now getting unconfirmed reports of a second British tanker uh, being seized in the Gulf by Iran. Uh, the second oil tanker uh, called Liberian flagged uh, Mestar, I think that's, uh, that's how you pronounce it, uh, it turns sharply north towards Iran's coast uh, after passing westward through the Strait of Hormuz in the Gulf. And uh, the turn took place at about 1600 GMT. Now the data uh, showed about 40 minutes after a similar core shift um, by the first tanker that was seized. Um, so there's no immediate word from the guards about the second tanker or from the operator of the second tanker and what had prompted the change in direction uh, along this vital international oil shipping route. So there is criticism uh, tonight here on BBC News um, that the government should have more naval vesses, uh, vessels protecting uh, British interests uh, in the Strait of Hormuz. Now, this seizure of the first oil tanker, we don't know if there has been a second, we still need that confirmed, uh, comes just hours after the British government announced that it will continue uh, to uh, hold and seize uh, Grace One, an Iranian registered oil tanker that uh, Britain believes was heading towards Syria, uh, breaking EU sanctions against delivering oil uh, to the Assad regime, something Iran denies, uh, but uh, that tanker, Grace One, uh, will continue to be docked in Gibraltar uh, for another 30 days. Iran did promise that there would be revenge uh, for the seizure of that tanker, and it seems we're seeing it tonight. Well, let's get more now on our breaking news tonight. Iran says it seized a British flagged tanker in the Gulf. It says the Stena Impero was stopped because it was not observing international maritime rules. The company that owns the tanker says it was approached by unidentified boats and a helicopter while in international waters. A second vessel is now reported to have turned sharply north towards Iran after passing through the same area. I got reaction from the former British ambassador to Iran, Sir Richard Dalton, after the first tanker was seized. Well, I'm very surprised that the owners of this this uh, tanker decided to send it through the Straits of Hormuz just a couple of days after explicit threat from the leader of Iran, Ayatollah Khamenei, uh, for, of retaliation for what Ayatollah Khamenei described as British privacy, pir piracy in Gibraltar. Uh, furthermore, unlike the tanker which had Montrose shadowing it on that previous occasion, uh, there seems to have been no British naval vessels in reach. So it's easy to say, but it does look like a rash act on behalf of the owners of this vessel to send it through uh, at this particular time. Of course, Iran should not have done it. Uh, this tanker, the latest incident, took place in an international waterway. Uh, but it's a measure of Iran's desperation at the state of its economy and the state of its relations with the rest of the world over the nuclear agreement, uh, as your correspondent was saying, that they are now so trigger happy. And it's something urgent has got to be done uh, to talk the Iranians down and to secure flexibility from all those involved in implementing the nuclear deal, including the United States, uh, in order to de-escalate these very serious tensions. Well, let's uh, just remind you of uh, the latest uh, developments uh, regarding this uh, story. Uh, we understand that uh, Donald Trump 
has said uh, to reporters outside the White House, uh, we may be able to bring you uh, that clip very shortly, um, that he intends to speak to the UK, who are currently in a COBRA emergency meeting uh, discussing this. Uh, this is not just about tankers being seized by Iran uh, in response to an Iranian tanker being seized by Britain, of course. This is about the Iran nuclear deal, which uh, collapsed under Donald Trump's presidency, uh, saying that he didn't believe Iran uh, would abandon its nuclear ambitions and therefore implemented the sanctions that uh, should have been lifted in return for Iran abandoning its nuclear ambitions. Uh, anyhow, what's uh, happened since then is uh, a tanker called Grace One was seized um, by British Marines because it, it was believed it was on its way to Syria to deliver oil to President Assad. Uh, which is against uh, EU sanctions, in breach of EU sanctions. Iran deny that, but they haven't shown any proof uh, to back up that denial. As a result, Grace won the tanker remains in Gibraltar and will do, it was announced today, for at least another 30 days. So tonight reports that two tankers have been seized in the Gulf by Iran, British tankers, British crew on board. Uh, this is what President Trump uh, had to say to reporters when he heard the news. Well, as you know, we have a very close alliance with the UK, and we always have. Uh, we heard that. The United States has very few tankers going in because we're using our own energy now. Uh, we've made a lot of progress over the last two and a half years. So we don't have very many tankers going in, but we have a lot of ships there that are warships. And we'll talk to the UK, and we have no written agreement, but we have an agreement. They've been a very great ally of ours. So we heard about it. We heard it was one, we heard it was two. And we'll be working with the UK. They'll have a new prime minister soon, which is a good thing. And we'll be working with the UK. But we have no written agreement, but I think we have an agreement which is long standing. President Trump uh, speaking to uh, reporters just a, a few moments ago. Uh, we understand the Foreign Office are, of course, uh, investigating exactly what's uh, happened. Uh, we know there were 23 crew on board uh, the first tanker to uh, be seized by Iran. Unconfirmed reports a second tanker has been seized. We don't know how many crew, we don't know the details of the crew of that tanker, but what we do know is that it's uh, sharply made a turn towards Iran in the same area the first tanker was seized. Um, we have had criticism uh, this evening uh, from various uh, naval uh, experts and, and, and Lord West, of course, as well. Uh, saying that there should be more naval area protecting British interests and, of course, other uh, cargo going through this uh, very busy uh, international channel, uh, mainly for oil, but other cargo as well. Um, so uh, if we do hear from the government, we get to speak to the government or anybody from the government tonight, we'll certainly be asking why there's only one uh, Royal Navy uh, vessel in that area protecting uh, goodness knows how many uh, cargo ships uh, that pass uh, through that area. Now we're just uh, hearing um, that the UK Ministry of Defence is saying that they are aware of reports that a second tanker has been seized by Iran. Uh, the Liberian MV Mestar is British owned. Uh, we're just hearing that from uh, our defence correspondent Jonathan Beale. Uh, so he's been in touch with the UK Ministry of Defence. They are aware of reports of a second tanker so they are investigating that. Still not confirmed yet but it does look like two British tankers, uh, almost certainly one, have been seized by Iran this evening. Uh, we'll keep you updated here on BBC News, uh, live updates on the BBC News website as well. Uh, but now it's time for the last programme in this series of Newswatch. Here's Samira Ahmed. Hello and welcome to World News Today. We start with some breaking news and Iran's Revolutionary Guard say they have seized a British flagged tanker in the Gulf. Iran says the Stena Impero was stopped while passing through the Strait of Hormuz on the grounds that it was not observing international maritime rules. The Stena Impero was bound for Al Jabail in Saudi Arabia, but it appears to have taken a sudden turn into Iranian waters this afternoon. It was last tracked heading towards the Iranian island of Keshem. The company that owns the tanker has confirmed that it was approached by unidentified small boats and a helicopter while it was still in international waters. It has since been uncontactable. We also have early reports that a second UK-operated tanker sailing under a Liberian flag 
also made a sharp turn towards Iran in the Persian Gulf. Let's get more now on the situation. Joining me is our defence correspondent, Jonathan Beale. Jonathan, welcome to you. What more do we know about this first tanker and also the official government reaction here in the UK? Yeah, so, so we know definitely that one tanker was taken, uh, Steno Impera. That's been confirmed by the Iranian Revolutionary Guard, even though the company says it was international, in international waters. Um, the Revolutionary Guard is saying that it was um, not obeying um, uh, maritime rules, in other words, was straying into their territory. Um, I think you've got to take that with a pinch of salt. But also, importantly, seems to be confirmation from the Foreign Secretary now that a second tanker has been taken. This is a Liberian flag tanker, the MV Mezdar, uh, but British owned, we understand. That was taken this evening. And this statement from uh, Jeremy Hunt, the Foreign Secretary, saying, I'm extremely concerned by the seizure of these two naval vessels. Um, he says that uh, the ambassador in Tehran is in contact with the Iranian Ministry of Foreign Affairs to resolve the situation. These seizures are unacceptable, he says, and it's essential that freedom of navigation is maintained. We understand that none of the crew, uh, we know that there were 23 cr crew on board Stena Impera. We don't know how many crew on the second ship, but none of them are believed to be British citizens. But uh, clearly, I mean, Britain is deeply involved in this now. And we know that this was a warning that Iran made because after earlier this month, uh, British Royal Marines were involved in seizing an Iranian oil tanker off the coast of Gibraltar. Iran sent a very clear message that they would retaliate, and this is the retaliation. Meanwhile, the wider context of this is, is not just that, but we've also had another event in the Strait of Hormuz, the US shooting down an Iranian drone, the Iranians saying, no, you didn't. So just explain how that fits into to the wider picture. Yeah, I, I, th I think you've, you know, you've got to separate them slightly in that clearly tensions rose with Iran, have been rising uh, ever since America pulled out of that international nuclear deal and imposed much tougher sanctions on Iran. Britain and France, Germany have not done the same. They are trying to keep that deal together, but it's clearly fraying at the edges. Um, the response, this response we're talking about in seizing these two tankers is clearly a reaction by Iran to what Britain did in Gibraltar, off the coast of Gibraltar, by seizing that Iranian tanker. They said they were perfectly within, in, 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 you know, they were doing something because that tanker was breaking sanctions uh, on Syria, EU sanctions on Syria. Iran has demanded that that tanker be released. We know it's being held for at least uh, another 10 days in Gibraltar. Probably it will become part of the bargaining chip now. But I think the other thing to say is that, you know, there's been one British warship out there. And, you know, any one given time, there are around 30 ships which have a British interest, whether it's flagged, owned or carrying British goods, uh, in that region. And one ship, one warship is not enough. And we've heard from a, a former First Sea Lord, head of the Royal Navy, saying that he is astonished. He's, he finds it absolutely extraordinary, said Lord West, that those vessels were not protected, given the warnings that have come out from, from Tehran. What do you think, now that we know the British government, we've heard from the Foreign Secretary saying this is a serious situation, there's an emergency meeting of the most senior members of the British government this evening to discuss this. What options are on the table? How do they try and de-escalate or at least resolve this situation now? I mean, it's very difficult because, you know, all along, the reasons, I think, why they've kept a relatively low military posture in that region, Britain, unlike the Americans who've sent more warships there, is because they don't want tensions to escalate. Uh, you know, they, they, they want Iran around the negoti negotiating table about that nuclear deal, for starters. They want to resolve um, the issue of the ship that was seized off Gibraltar. They didn't want, um, want to up the ante with Iran. But now the ante, you know, it is now very high tensions and Britain has got to resolve this. Do they send more warships? Um, do they hope that by, you know, having discussions about that ship that they seized off Gibraltar, that they can release that and then Iran would release the other two? You know, we don't know. Um, and, you know, there's nothing clear, transparent about Iranian behaviour. So I think this is a very, very difficult situation. And I think the government here will face difficult questions about why it hadn't sent more ships to protect these tankers going through the Strait of Hormuz, which has always been, you know, a vulnerable choke point. OK, Jonathan, thank you. We'll have more on this story a little later in the programme. This is BBC News. I'm Martin Stanford. Our top stories. 
Iran seizes a British flagged oil tanker in the Gulf. The Stena Impero was bound for Saudi Arabia and has 23 people on board. The vessel was tracked moving off course to the north, no longer in contact with its owners. Iran has reported that it's captured a British oil tanker in the Strait of Hormuz. The Stena Imperio was bound for Saudi Arabia when the owners say they lost contact with the vessel. There are 23 personnel on board, but no British citizens are among them. It comes after an Iranian vessel was captured earlier this month. James Robbins reports. This is Stena Impero, built only last year. British flagged, 183 metres long, now in the hands of Iran, together with her 23 crew. Routine satellite tracking of the tanker shows her underway from the Emirates of Fujairah around midday, heading north, staying well inside international waters of the Gulf until this happens. Just after three o'clock, the 30,000 ton tanker diverts seriously off course. Her last known movement was around four o'clock inside Iranian waters. The owners, Stena Balkan Northern Marine Management, say in a statement, Stena Impero was approached by unidentified small craft and a helicopter during transit of the Strait of Hormuz while the vessel was in international waters. We are presently unable to contact the vessel, which is now heading north towards Iran. There are 23 seafarers aboard. There have been no reported injuries, and their safety is of primary concern to both owners and managers. And then news tonight that a second ship had been seized, the Mezdar, Liberian registered. It has now been released. The Foreign Secretary, Jeremy Hunt, condemned the seizures as unacceptable, saying he was extremely concerned. And President Trump confirmed the news. So we don't have very many tankers going in, but we have a lot of ships there that are warships. And we'll talk to the UK. And we have no written agreement, but we have an agreement. They've been a very great ally of ours. So we heard about it. We heard it was one, we heard it was two, and we'll be working with the UK. These are pictures released by Iran, said to show boats of the Islamic Revolution Guard Corps circling another vessel, the Riyadh, in recent days. The Guard Corps appear to use these armed boats and sometimes helicopters to force ships into their waters. Their efforts to seize British vessels were intensified after Royal Marines and Gibraltar police boarded and seized a tanker, Grace One. It was carrying Iranian oil in Gibraltar waters, suspected of heading for Syria in defiance of EU sanctions. Iran called this piracy, but that's dismissed as nonsense by Britain. That was followed by an incident in the Gulf when the British frigate Montrose moved in to protect the tanker British heritage in the Gulf. But the threat to British vessels was spelt out earlier this week by Iran's supreme leader. Evil Britain commits piracy and steals our ship. It's an act of piracy. Of course, the Islamic Republic will not leave such evil deeds unanswered. There will be a response at the appropriate time and place. So the Iranian Guard Corps will consider today's seizures a significant victory in a crisis which has been escalating for months. A former head of the Royal Navy, Lord West, says Britain simply has too few ships to provide escorts for merchant vessels. My biggest concern, I have to say, is I find it extraordinary that British flagged ships, tankers particularly, are steaming on their own into this area of danger. I mean, I think we should be trying to de-escalate, but you can't allow thugs and, and effectively criminal actions by a nation against your nation. With American warships the dominant naval force in the Gulf, British cooperation with Washington will be key if protection of a vital trade route is to be improved. But for now, the immediate focus will be on getting Iran to free the Stena Impero and her crew. James Robbins, BBC News. Well, the UK's Foreign Secretary Jeremy Hunt has condemned the seizure of the British tanker. He said Britain is pursuing diplomatic efforts to resolve the situation. Uh, I have spoken to Secretary of State Pompeo in the United States earlier this evening about the situation. I've tried to talk to Foreign Minister Zarif of Iran, but I understand that he's in a plane, so I will 
speak to him as soon as I can. Uh, this is completely unacceptable. Freedom of navigation must be maintained. Uh, we will respond in a way that is considered but robust. And we are absolutely clear that if this situation is not resolved quickly, there will be serious consequences. Well, I spoke just a short while ago with the CEO of the UK Chamber of Shipping, who's calling on the UK government to do whatever is necessary to secure the return of the 23 crewmen of the Stena Impero. We're extremely concerned at the, uh, the latest developments, which um, represents a serious escalation of the situation. Um, I think uh, what is needed uh, at the moment is cool heads to de-escalate the situation. Um, and whilst uh, that is taking place, uh, we urge the authorities to do what is necessary uh, through diplomatic channels uh, for the swift uh, and safe release of uh, the ship and the vessel. Uh, Lord West, uh, a Navy man like yourself, uh, has said it's ridiculous the level of protection for either UK flagged or UK owned vessels. Do you agree with him? Well, the, the, uh, the, the Royal Navy uh, ships in the area clearly can't be in, uh, in more than one place uh, at any one time. Um, I see this very much as, uh, as an international concern because uh, uh, the, the shipping, the trading that's taking place in the region is international uh, by its very nature. So what's needed is an international uh, effort uh, to try and uh, bring the situation back down under control and allow for the freedom of navigation uh, for ships and seafarers uh, to continue plying the waters of uh, the region. Well, we've got US warships there. We've got, I think, one UK warship. Should there be more? Well, um, we, we would like to see the situation uh, de-escalate, uh, but we would also like uh, to, to see um, uh, the security uh, of uh, our ships and seafarers guaranteed uh, and confidence return uh, so that they can carry on trading uh, as they're used to. If uh, what's needed uh, to guarantee that uh, safety is more ships, then we would be supportive of that move. Um, you also don't quite know who you're fighting here or who you're dealing with here, I should say in the sense of it, this, these kind of actions might be by Iranian government agencies, they might be by Iranian armed forces. It's, it's a complex uh, set of circumstances you're having to deal with. It, it is very complex indeed, which is, uh, which is why the, the top priority has to be uh, de-escalation and resolution through peaceful means. And in the meantime, uh, the swift return of uh, the sailors and the ship in question. Well, in that case, would you suggest that the Gibraltar authorities release the other vessel, which is thought to have been maybe the catalyst for these kind of tit-for-tat exchanges? Well, that, that's very much a political uh, decision, which, which I won't comment on. But I wouldn't draw too many parallels between the, uh, the legitimate arrest of a vessel in contravention of EU sanctions on the one hand, um, and the diversion and arrest uh, or, or, or hijack of a vessel going about its legitimate, legitimate business in the international waters of the Straits of Hormuz. Bob Sanguinetti is speaking to us a little earlier. Well, that's a UK spokesman. Let's get a North American perspective. Let's bring in Peter Bowles, joining us um, from Los Angeles. Peter, the president clearly being kept well informed as to what's going on. Yes, and he was uh, very quick to respond to the events of the last few hours. He was leaving the White House for his uh, weekend retreat and he was asked about uh, what had happened in the Gulf and he referred to the special relationship, the long-term special relationship between the US and the UK, which he described as a, a close ally. He said the US had uh, plenty of uh, military ships in the region and by implication was offering uh, whatever help the US could give to the UK in this uh, situation and of course uh, tensions have been rising considerably in the last few days indeed months between the US and Iran most recently the uh, war of words over drones and uh, according to Mr Trump just last month the US came within about 10 minutes of a military strike after Iran shot down one of its drones and then just in the last few days uh, the US claiming to have shot down an Iranian drone although the Iranians say that they have no knowledge of that. In London, we're keeping an eye on what British politicians and military might be doing. Any word from the Pentagon, as far as you're aware? 
Well, what we're hearing is uh, in relation to uh, troops which uh, are being sent to and deployed in Saudi Arabia, there's been uh, a statement just in the last few minutes from the U.S. Defense Secretary from uh, U.S. Central Command on U.S. personnel to Saudi Arabia. And I'll just read the, the first part of the statement saying that in coordination with and at the invitation of the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, the Defense Secretary has authorized the movement of U.S. personnel and resources to deploy to Saudi Arabia. The movement of forces, the statement says, provides an additional deterrent and ensures uh, the U.S.'s ability to defend its forces and interests in the region from emergent credible threats. And I think this just adds to the clearly the, the tensions that uh, have been uh, growing over the last few days and uh, essentially this uh, appears to be the US shoring up its uh, reserves in that region for whatever may happen, whatever intelligence the US has about uh, possible future activities in the region. Because one of the opinions we, we're getting from an Iranian perspective is that that original detention of the Grace One vessel off the coast of Gibraltar was actually done by the British at the encouragement of the Americans. Have, has, has anyone in America admitted that that was the case, Peter, as far as you're aware? There hasn't been any tacit acknowledgement that that is the case, but uh, certainly the, uh, the holding of, of that vessel off Gibraltar does seem to be at the heart of, in terms of the background to the events of of the last few hours. Very definitely we're seeing a sort of tit-for-tat uh, response uh, as far as the Iranians are concerned, just how deeply involved uh, the Americans have been. That, that isn't entirely clear, but we can always fall back on the fact that, and as President Trump referred to it, that special relationship, uh, even though there have been some difficulties in the last few weeks, uh, the UK and the US do work closely together on these things. Peter Bowes, thank you very much. Let's stay with that story. Fawa Jerjes is a Middle East expert from the London School of Economics. I asked him whether he was surprised by the Iranian reaction. No, I'm not surprised at all. Iranian leaders, including the top leader, the Supreme Leader, Ali Khamenei, made it very clear two days ago that the seizure of the Iranian supertanker by British armed forces will not go unpunished. This is a direct retaliation for the seizure of the Iranian uh, supertanker on the 4th of July. It's a clear message by Iran, a clear message that Iran has the will and the means to retaliate. My take on it is that the Iranian leadership will likely use the seizure of the, the, the British flag uh, vessel in order to help free their own super tanker that's still, uh, uh, I mean, under arrest for the next 30 days. Because the Gibraltar authorities have said they're going to hold on to that for the time being, aren't they? They also maintain it was doing something demonstrably wrong. It was trying to take oil to Syria. That's exactly, that's exactly what the British government and the Gibraltar officials have said. The Iranians view the thing differently. The Iranians believe that the seizure of the super tanker was not an isolated act. It was an integral part of the economic war waged on them by Trump, by Donald Trump. So they don't, and, and this is really where it gets complicated. My question is, how wise was the decision by the United Kingdom to seize the super tanker? Was it really a misguided decision based on an American request? Because there are many reports that it was the Americans who requested that British forces seized the super tanker, three million barrels of oil. This is a massive, massive super tanker that was seized by British forces on the 4th of July. So the Iranian view remains is that the British were merely doing America's bidding. They were doing Donald Trump's work for him in taking that, in, in arresting the ship off the coast of Gibraltar. Absolutely. Even though the British were not doing America's deeds, they were not doing Donald Trump's deeds, but that's how it's viewed by the Iranians. The British say that the ship, the Iranian super tanker, was heading towards Syria. And the European Union has sanctioned, has sanctioned Syria in the past few years. The reality is the crisis in the Gulf is getting complicated and more dangerous by the day. Mm -hmm. There's a real danger that escalation could really trigger uh, you know, further escalation, and here you have a bloody war between Iran on the one hand and the Western powers on the other hand.
We've just got some reaction from the British government. The what they call a Cobra meeting of various experts from across government were meeting tonight, and this is the conclusions. We remain, say the British government, deeply concerned about Iran's unacceptable actions, which represent a clear challenge to international freedom of navigation. We have advised UK shipping to stay out of the area for an interim period. And that's the word of the British government tonight. They go on, as the Foreign Secretary has said, our response will be considered and robust, and there will be serious consequences if the situation is not resolved. And the final sentence of the statement, we remain in close contact with our international partners. There will be further meetings over the weekend. That's the British government reaction, um, which the most striking line seems to be that they're advising UK shipping then to stay out of this area, the Strait of Hormuz, um, for an interim period. The very latest coming out of Downing Street uh, in the last few moments. My biggest concern, I have to say, is I find it extraordinary that British flagged ships, tankers particularly, are steaming on their own into this area of danger. I mean, I think we should be trying to de-escalate, but you can't mm. allow thugs and, and effectively criminal actions by a nation against your nation. With American warships the dominant naval force in the Gulf, British cooperation with Washington will be key if protection of a vital trade route is to be improved. But for now, the immediate focus will be on getting Iran to free the Stena Impero and her crew. James Robbins, BBC News. Well, speaking before the latest statement, the British Foreign Secretary Jeremy Hunt had this to say about the seizure of the tanker. Uh, I have spoken to Secretary of State Pompeo in the United States earlier this evening about the situation. I've tried to talk to Foreign Minister Zarif of Iran, but I understand that he's in a plane, so I will speak to him as soon as I can. Uh, this is completely unacceptable. Freedom of navigation must be maintained. Uh, we will respond in a way that is considered but robust. And we are absolutely clear that if this situation is not resolved quickly, there will be serious consequences. Jeremy Hunt there well, with me. Simon Jones has been following that uh, COBRA meeting that has uh, just finished up. Can you tell us more about this latest uh, statement from the British government? It's the government's emergency committee known as COBRA met well into the night showing how serious they're treating this situation and they have released a statement after that meeting. They're describing the seizure of the British tanker as completely unacceptable. They say it goes completely against international maritime rules. They say they're deeply concerned about tensions in the region and interesting Interestingly, they're saying that they're suggesting that British shipping should stay out of that area for the time being, which is quite a development when obviously there are a large number of tankers passing through, particularly in the international community. There's also in this statement talk again of a robust response and of consequences for Iran. What it doesn't spell out is what exactly they mean by that. They're not spelling out any sort of deadline. They're not saying to Tehran, you've got to return this tanker by this particular time. I don't think they want to escalate things in that way. Way, but talk of consequences, but not really entirely clear what they mean by that. So have they ruled out using force? The Foreign Secretary there from Britain said he wasn't looking at any sort of military action. He wanted to go down the route of diplomacy. As we've heard, he's been talking to his US counterpart. He's been trying to talk to his counterpart in Tehran, but hasn't been able to make contact. So I think definitely going down that diplomatic route and possibly the government saying there are going to be more emergency meetings in the coming days over the weekend. So suggesting they're not necessarily expecting a quick resolution to this, but trying perhaps to build some some sort of international coalition to put pressure on Iran to say this is unacceptable and uniting the US, the UK, other countries in Europe to say, come on, you've got to release this ship. But this does come at a very awkward time for the UK government. Yeah, British politics very much in a state of turmoil. Jeremy Hunt, who we heard from there, is one of two contenders to become a new prime minister for Britain, which is going to be announced next week. So there's some speculation that Iran has chosen this moment to act because the British government is in this state of flux. Some are saying pretty weak at the moment. There's a lack of leadership from the top with the current Prime Minister Theresa May passing her last few days as Prime Minister. So it's possible that Iran saw this as a moment to try and escalate tensions. But certainly there's a deep concern 
in the British government and we're expecting more of these emergency meetings in the coming hours and days. All right, Simon Jones, thank you very much for giving us analysis there on the UK side. But joining me now is our North America correspondent, Peter Bowes, for more of what's happening uh, in the US. Uh, Peter, um, we've actually essentially seen a, a tit for tat, essentially, an escalating tit for tat between Iran and the US. Yes, and this seems to have been going on for a number of weeks, uh, especially in relation to the drones that we've been hearing about. And, uh, well, uh, President Trump, uh, according to his own words, uh, said we came within 10 minutes, uh, at least the U.S. came within 10 minutes of launching uh, military action against Iran after the shooting down of one of uh, America's drones. And then just in the last few days, uh, the U.S. saying that it uh, destroyed one of Iran's drones, although Iran saying that it doesn't know anything about that. So certainly, yes, there is a, a tit-for-tat feeling about what is going on. But the events of uh, these last few hours uh, late on Friday really seem to have ratcheted up the, the tensions that exist not only between the U.S and Iran, but of course uh, the tensions now between Iran and the United Kingdom. And we heard from President Trump how he is standing by the United Kingdom, referring to that uh, close relationship, describing the UK as a close ally, talking about the military vessels that the US has in the region and by implication uh, offering uh, to help the UK uh, in whatever way the, the US, the UK might want. Although, as again we've been hearing, diplomatic uh, discussions, diplomatic action seems to be the preferred course of action, at least uh, for the foreseeable future. Now, in amongst all of this, we've been hearing about a U.S. troop deployment to Saudi Arabia. Can you explain that and whether it's connected? It seems as if it is certainly connected to the overall tensions and the problems that we're seeing in the Gulf, especially that a crucial shipping lane and the, the dangers that are now posed to, to vessels in those international waters. And uh, what uh, the U.S. Defense uh, Department has announced is uh, the deployment of troops to Saudi Arabia, where previously for the last few years there haven't been any U.S. troops that we understand 500 in number, Patriot air defense missile systems, the F-22 stealth fighters will also be deployed to a base in Saudi Arabia to, uh, according to the U.S., to protect uh, American interests, but also to respond to what it describes as credible threats in the region. Is part of the problem here that Iran is essentially playing into Donald Trump's hands, doing what Donald Trump maybe expected or wanted them to do? Well, you could almost turn that around and say that uh, Donald Trump may well feel that uh, he has been proven correct uh, in terms of his attitude towards Iran and what Iran is capable of doing. He's taken a very hard line, of course, pulling out of the uh, nuclear agreement and, and being really at odds with uh, his European allies and going it alone in terms of that hard line, of course, the increased sanctions against Iran and uh, President Trump may well feel as if uh, he has, his action has uh, been shown to be the correct course of action when dealing with a nation like Iran. All right, so Peter Bowes, our North America correspondent, thank you very much for that. Let's get more on that story now with Sarah Vakhshuri as an energy security and global oil market analyst and the president of her own energy consultancy based in Washington. She joins me now. Sarah, thank you so much for your time. Uh, I'm wondering what Iran is trying to achieve here. Is it trying to disrupt the global oil market? Well, n not as of now, but uh Iranian uh, government officials uh, in different occasions before uh, May 2019 that the sanctions were implemented announced that uh, if Iran is not able to sell a drop of oil, then none of the neighbors are going to be able to sell and uh, sell their oils and supply the market. And it seems that uh, the market is going through a more uh, tense situation than many of these oil tankers that are passing through the Strait of Hormuz and also the other uh, uh, waters around this area are facing a serious threat. So what does it mean then for the global oil trade thus far? We've seen some skirmishes. How reliant are we on oil coming from the Middle East? 
Well, historically, Middle East had uh, lots of ups and downs, and the supply of uh, oil from this region, uh, this is not the first time that there is a threat of interruptions. But uh, we do not think that Iran is going to use the Strait of Hormuz card to close the strait. As of now, it might be the last card to use. But it seems that now it started to flex its muscles and use uh, the tensions that has been created uh, as a message to the world that things could get worse if it's not able to easily have its oil tankers and oil pass through the international waters. Now, the UK, uh, as of uh, this evening, has warned uh, other British tankers to avoid the area. Are there alternative routes other than the Strait of Hormuz so that British tankers and other tankers can, can travel and, and, and transport their oil in a safe manner? Yes, there are other alternative routes, but um, there is a significant capacity that is passing through the Strait of Hormuz. And it's very hard to imagine bypass all of this capacity. But uh, it's very normal and uh, followed by British uh, tankers and British ships. There might be many other international uh, ships and tankers that might feel the same or get the same warning. And it's very important to consider that in the past few weeks, the insurance premium for the tankers and ships that are going and entering the Strait of Hormuz has been significantly increased, which is obviously have an impact on the uh, prices uh, to the end users. And this have been even more so on the uh, for the British tankers uh, since uh, Iran started threatening the British uh, tankers. So politically, where do you see things going now? How, how much worse can it get? Uh, well, I think that uh, more than many give, give it credit, things are tense, more than uh, maybe uh, the market seems still has kept its calm, the prices have incre increased uh, slightly, but it, it seems that there is a mini war going on uh, in this region and different parties are trying to take uh, test each other's patience and capabilities. And this tit for tat, um, uh, operations that are all affecting the flow of uh, flow of oil and also other goods uh, through the commercial uh, ships and tanker uh, ships and uh, other uh, uh, vessels in this uh, water have all been impacted and it seems that things are just getting more tense uh, immediately after the Gibraltar uh, government announced that they have been delayed the release of Iranian tanker. We see the uh, tanker uh, today, the British tanker has been seized. Yesterday there was another story on a UAE tanker. There have been incidents and attacks and explosions uh, of tankers. So, so the market and the area Sarah, has been Sarah, great. thank you so much. There's so much to unpack. Uh, Sarah Vakshuri, thank you so much for your time there. Now, don't forget, you can get a lot more on that story as it develops, all the different angles and perspectives. Uh, uh, we're all working on it on our website as well. That address is bbc.com forward slash news or download the BBC News app. It's there. Now, meanwhile, the Pentagon says that the acting U.S. Defense Secretary has authorized the deployment of U.S. troops and resources to Saudi Arabia. It said the move, which comes at a time of heightened tensions in the Gulf, would provide an additional deterrent to what it said were credible threats. The U.S. is understood to be deploying Patriot air defense missile batteries manned by 500 American soldiers. And the Pentagon also plans to send a squadron of F-22 stealth fighters. Now, don't forget, you can get all the latest on our website, uh, the multiple angles and the issues with the tanker, and also uh, the U.S. says a drone was shot down as well. That's all at bbc.com forward slash news. Let's get more now on that uh, seizure by Iran of a British flagged oil tanker in the Strait of Hormuz. Well, joining me now from Irvine, California, is Dr. Asal Rad, a research fellow at the National Iranian American Council. Uh, Dr. Rad, thank you so much for your time. Uh, first of all, we've seen this tanker seized. We saw another tanker sort of temporarily, uh, you know, boarded and, and then sent on its way. Why is Iran doing this? I think we have to understand Iranian actions within a long-term context. So we can go back to two weeks ago and talk about the UK seizure of an Iranian tanker 
But I think really we have to go back further than that to over a year ago when the United States breached the JCPOA, otherwise called the Iran nuclear deal. The importance of breaching the deal was that we are in the current situation we are because of that abrogation. Uh, Iran not getting the economic relief that it was promised through the deal is why Iran is now a year later after practicing sort of strategic patience, not doing anything provoking, complying with the deal, has borne it no benefits. And so now we're seeing Iran shift strategies uh, over the last month or so, or the last two months or so, because they haven't gotten any relief in terms of their, uh, in terms of sanctions, in terms of the economy, and that's what they were promised through the deal. If this is the, more than just about what's happening with the UK, isn't the problem here that Iran is really playing into Donald Trump's hands. Donald Trump can say, see, I told you, Iran is a, is a bad actor. Look at what they're doing. It's certainly a risk on the Iranian part. Um, and let me be very clear. I think restraint should be shown on all sides. That includes the Iranian side, the US side, and the UK, which is why I applaud uh, Secretary Hunt for saying that the UK is not looking at military options. And they're still trying to use dip diplomatic options in resolving these issues. Um, the idea that Iran is in the situation right now is still an effect of not getting the relief that they were promised in the JCPOA. Uh, while you could argue that they're playing into Trump's hands, at the same time, doing nothing for a year also got them nothing, right? So they spent over a year doing absolutely nothing, complying by the deal, no provocations, and this particular trade route, the Strait of Hormuz, which is so important and is partially controlled by Iran, was had no problems, right? These are all recent actions that have occurred, the seizures it, of the it, tanks. It, it, is, it is a very dangerous strategy on the behalf of, of Iran because the UK hasn't been supporting thus far uh, what the US has done with the Iran nuclear deal. But it might be pushing the UK into the US's hands and turning the international community against Iran. I, I mean, it's just very confusing in that sense. Uh, well, I think the Iranian side would argue that U.S. policy is confusing, right? On one hand, you have a president who talks about uh, one day obliterating the country, the next day wanting negotiations. So there's, there's an incoherent policy coming out of the U.S. And while uh, it's absolutely important that the U.K., uh, France, Germany, Russia, China have all continued to support the JCPOA, in reality, they've only done so rhetorically, right? Uh, there's... There's a difference between what gets said and what's actually getting done. And on the ground, Iranians are suffering through sanctions. So from the Iranian perspective, the state must either act because of the pressure that they're receiving from their own people, or they can sit and show their own weakness by basically complying with the deal that nobody else is complying by. All right. A uh, very vexed situation, to say the least. Uh, Dr. Asal Rad, thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Hello, welcome to BBC World News. The UK's Foreign Secretary is warning there will be serious consequences if Iran doesn't release a British tanker seized in the Gulf with 22 crew on board. The Steno Impera was heading for the Saudi Arabian port of Jubail, but contact was lost with her as she passed through the Strait of Hormuz. Tracking data shows it deviating from an intended route. Iranian media is quoting military officials saying it's being taken to the port in Bandar Abbas for further investigations. Simon Jones has this report. Seized in a major escalation of tensions, the Stena Impero, a British flag tanker and its 23 crew members from India, Russia, Latvia and the Philippines now in the hands of Iran after it was surrounded by four boats and a helicopter. This is completely unacceptable. Freedom of navigation must be maintained. We will respond in a way that is considered but robust. And we are absolutely clear that if this situation is not resolved quickly, there will be serious consequences. The tanker was tracked leaving the United Arab Emirates heading north, staying well inside the international waters of the Gulf. But on Friday, the 30,000-ton vessel makes an abrupt change of course, its last known movement inside Iranian waters. I find it extraordinary that British-flagged ships, tankers particularly, 
are steaming on their own into this area of danger. An announcement on Iranian TV claimed the tanker had failed to respect international maritime rules. Its British operator says that's not true. London is now urging UK ships to stay out of the area for the time being. The US president is rallying to Britain's support. We have a lot of ships there that are warships and we'll talk to the UK and we have no written agreement but we have an agreement. They've been a very great ally of ours. A second British-owned tanker, the Mezdar, was boarded by armed guards but has now been allowed to continue on its journey. Iran's actions are believed to be in response to this, the Royal Marines helping to seize an Iranian supertanker off the coast of Gibraltar earlier this month. Britain believed it was smuggling oil to Syria in violation of EU sanctions. Tehran accused London of piracy. A meeting of the government's emergency committee, COBRA, went on late into the night. The big question now, who will make the next move? Simon Jones, BBC News. Well, some breaking news uh, developments on this story in the past few minutes. We've just uh, heard from the Iranian news agency Fars uh, quoting I Iranian officials that the Steno Impero was involved in an accident uh, with an Iranian fishing boat before it was seized uh, and that the ship has now been taken, as we thought, to Bandar Abbas port in Iran. Uh, all 23 crew members, uh, a range of nationalities, no, uh, no British on board, uh, will remain on board until authorities have completed their investigations. Our North America correspondent Peter Bowes explained what led up to these latest developments uh, in the Gulf. Hello, good morning. Welcome to BBC News. The government has advised UK ships to stay out of the area of the Strait of Hormuz for an interim period after Iran seized a British flagged tanker there. The warning came after a meeting of the government's emergency committee, COBRA, late last night. State media in Tehran say the tanker, the Stena Impero, was involved in an accident with an Iranian fishing boat before it was seized. Reports also claim the vessel had violated international maritime rules. But the ship's owner, the Swedish company Stena Bulkt, says the tanker was in full compliance with all navigation and international regulations. Well, the Foreign Secretary, Jeremy Hunt, said the seizure was unacceptable and Britain's response would be considered but robust. Our correspondent, Simon Jones, has more. Seized in a major escalation of tensions, the Stena Impero, a British flag tanker and its 23 crew members from India, Russia, Latvia and the Philippines now in the hands of Iran after it was surrounded by four boats and a helicopter. This is completely unacceptable. Freedom of navigation must be maintained. We will respond in a way that is considered but robust and we are absolutely clear that if this situation is not resolved quickly there will be serious consequences. The tanker was tracked leaving the United Arab Emirates heading north, staying well inside the international waters of the Gulf. But just after three o'clock yesterday afternoon, the 30,000 tonne vessel makes an abrupt change of course, its last known movement inside Iranian waters. An announcement on Iranian TV claimed the tanker had failed to respect international maritime rules. Its British operator says that's not true. London is now urging UK ships to stay out of the area for the time being. There is no alternative route uh, in and out of uh, the Gulf, so um, if, if this uh, is, is to endure, then clearly it go it's going to impact on uh, our trade routes, trade patterns and ultimately uh, the price of, uh, of those goods. The US president is rallying to Britain's support. We have a lot of ships there that are warships and we'll talk to the UK and we have no written agreement, but we have an agreement. They've been a very great ally of ours. A second British-owned tanker, the Mezdar, was boarded by armed guards, but has now been allowed to continue on its journey. Iran's actions are believed to be in response to this, the Royal Marines helping to seize an Iranian supertanker off the coast of Gibraltar earlier this month. Britain believed it was smuggling oil to Syria in violation of EU sanctions. Tehran accused London of piracy. A meeting of the government's emergency committee, COBRA, went on late into the night. The big question now, who will make the next move? Simon Jones, BBC News.
Well, this morning, the Foreign Secretary Jeremy Hunt tweeted, Yesterday's action in the Gulf shows worrying signs Iran may be choosing a dangerous path of illegal and destabilizing behavior after Gibraltar's legal detention of oil bound for Syria. As I said yesterday, Mr. Hunt adds, our reaction will be considered but robust. We've been trying to find a way to resolve Grace One issue, that's the ship that was seized by the, uh, by the uh, Gibraltar Coast Guard, but will ensure the safety of our shipping. Well, let's talk now to our correspondent, Catherine Acosta, who's outside the Foreign Office for us this morning. Good morning, Catherine. Um, just fill us in on, on those latest developments, because that seems, sounds as slightly hardening, a toughening of the language, at least, that the Foreign Secretary's used compared to what he was saying last night. Yes, that's right. The, um, the Foreign Office has issued a statement saying there's going to be extra emergency meetings here in London over the course of the weekend. And it's reiterated its deep concern over the incident and says that it's warned of serious consequences. Now, quite what that means hasn't been spelt out. But Jeremy Hunt, the Foreign Secretary, has said he's not considering military intervention at this time. He's looking to diplomacy. He's been in touch with his counterpart in the US. His counterpart in Iran wasn't available yesterday. No doubt that will be a matter of urgency to speak to him today. Now, as you say in the tweet this morning, Mr. Hunt said he was concerned that Iran was taking a dangerous path. But Iran has a different account. A news agency there says the British tanker was involved in an incident, an accident with an Iranian fishing boat. It's been taken to an Iranian port and it says that the 23 members of crew remain on board and that will remain the case while investigations carried out. And Catherine, uh, what about uh, how this compares with the previous developments? Because in a sense, some have argued that there were signs that Iran was becoming much more aggressive in the Straits of Hormuz and, and have questioned whether the British approach was sufficient to prepare for that. Yes, yeah, some feel that this wasn't unexpected. Uh, tensions flared earlier this month when Royal Marines seized an Iranian tanker that was suspected of taking oil to Syria. That would have breached EU sanctions. In response, Tehran accused Britain of piracy and threatened to retaliate. Um, now, in the meantime, British trips have been warned not to go down that area and the US has added extra ships and security in the Gulf. But clearly this is an ongoing situation. It's a very volatile situation and uh, that looks like it could be a difficult situation to resolve anytime soon. Catherine de Costa at the Foreign Office, thank you very much. Let's talk now to our correspondent in the Middle East, Lena Sinjab, who's monitoring developments from Beirut. Uh, Lena, obviously a lot of concern around the Middle East and particularly around the Gulf countries, those directly affected by the Straits of Hormuz, about any incident there which might uh, be a potential threat to shipping. What's been said in the course of the last few hours about uh, this incident? Well, so far there hasn't been any official reaction from the region or from governments in the region, but of course everyone is watching and in, and in anticipation of what the next move is going to be taken, especially by the Iranian government. So of course, uh, as we just heard from uh, my colleague that, uh, you know, uh, Iran is responding to what happened earlier in the month by uh, the British Maritime, but also uh, this is an, a moment for the Iranian government to use for leverage of negotiations. Iran is under immense pressure, economic pressure, because of the sanctions imposed by the U.S. They are feeling the burden of these economic sanctions, uh, both locally but also regionally because of their involvement in other regional countries like Syria. So this is a moment of using such an incident politically to uh, leverage uh, their position in negotiations and ask for some uh, relief uh, over uh, the sanctions imposed on them. The decision to uh, board a, a British flagged boat is clearly a, a conscious one and Iran has offered its explanation for it saying that the boat had been involved in some kind of collision. Presumably there's no outside corroboration of that allegation. No, there's so so far. It's all uh, the information are coming from the Iranian side. Of course, the, the British uh, uh, ship denied that uh, they have uh, uh, violated maritime regu regulations. But uh, uh, of course, uh, uh, this is a moment uh, for Iran to to seize uh, uh, as well uh, for their own uh, uh, benefits uh, in the region. 
in a Sinjab in Beirut. Thank you very much. Let's speak now to Bob Sanguinetti. He is Chief Executive of the UK Chamber of Shipping, the Trade Association, the voice of the UK shipping industry. Bob, uh, welcome to BBC News. Obviously a worrying time for those who operate ships uh, through the Straits of Hormuz. What is it you would like to see happen over the next couple of days? Good morning. Uh, well, in, in the first instance, uh, what we would like to see is the authorities, uh, UK government in particular, um, do whatever is necessary through diplomatic means uh, to secure uh, the release of the vessel and the innocent seafarers. Um, more generally, um, we uh, ask for a de-escalatory uh, move. Uh, I don't think uh, the raising of tensions further is in anybody's interest. There will be no winners if that's the case. So we call for caution, we call for de-escalation uh, so that uh, we can restore some sort of confidence and security uh, in the busy waters in the region so that ships and seafarers can carry on doing their business supporting global trade. But when you hear the British Foreign Secretary Jeremy Hunt say that yesterday's action in the Gulf shows worrying signs Iran may be choosing a dangerous path of illegal and destabilizing behavior, that doesn't suggest that this is going to de-escalate quickly. Well, it, it, uh, it, that, that appears to be the case, um, but the efforts must still be to try and find a de-escalatory solution to this so that uh, shipping can continue uh, to trade in uh, what is one of the busiest um, shipping lanes uh, of the world. Now, the, the vessel involved is flagged UK, but it's operated by a foreign company and its crew contain no British sailors. On what basis, then, is the British government inclined to intervene? Well, the, the UK government will have responsibility by virtue of the fact that the, the ship is registered in the UK and flies a UK flag. But I've, you've made a very, very relevant point in that this is an international issue uh, with um, sailors from a number of countries uh, on a ship that's owned um, in a foreign country and um, doing its business uh, of international trade uh, with other third parties. Uh, this is very much an international issue. It therefore requires an international solution. The heat might well be on the UK at the moment for obvious reasons, uh, but the threat will not discriminate between nationalities. And if the tension continues to rise, then it is the wider community that will suffer uh, and not just the UK. So we urge for a, an international solution uh, to this very worrying problem. In order to protect commercial shipping through the Straits of Hormuz, which is obviously such a, a critical part of the, uh, the shipping infrastructure uh, and, and allows for many goods to be transported, not least, of course, oil, uh, what, what, is it, what would be most effective, do you think, in protecting vessels? You're not talking about gunboats, presumably, but are you talking about some kind of escort pr provision? I, I wouldn't go into the specifics of the solution that might be needed. Uh, first and foremost, I think what's needed is, uh, is diplomacy. But in the absence of that, uh, I think um, if that confidence can only be provided to ships and seafarers through the presence of more warships, uh, multinational warships, I would stress, then we would, we would be very supportive of that move. Bob Sanguinetti uh, of the UK uh, Shipping Chamber, thank you very much for being with us. I'm sure we'll be talking again in the coming days. For now, thanks very much. Thank you. Hello, good morning. The Foreign Secretary Jeremy Hunt has warned Iran of serious consequences after the Iranian Revolutionary Guard seized a British-flagged oil tanker in the Gulf yesterday evening. The government's advised UK ships to stay out of the area of the Strait of Hormuz for what it calls an interim period after a meeting last night of the Emergency Committee of the British government, COBRA. State media in Tehran says the tanker, the Stena Impero, had violated international maritime rules, but the ship's owner, Swedish company Stena Bukt, says the tanker was in full compliance with all navigation and international regulations. While the Foreign Secretary Jeremy Hunt said the seizure was unacceptable and Britain's response would be considered but robust. Here's our correspondent, Simon Jones. Seized in a major escalation of tensions, the Stena Impero, a British flag tanker and its 23 crew members from India, Russia, Latvia and the Philippines now in the hands of Iran after it was surrounded by four boats and a helicopter. This is completely unacceptable 
freedom of navigation must be maintained. We will respond in a way that is considered but robust and we are absolutely clear that if this situation is not resolved quickly there will be serious consequences. The tanker was tracked leaving the United Arab Emirates heading north staying well inside the international waters of the Gulf. But just after three o'clock yesterday afternoon the 30,000 tonne vessel makes an abrupt change of course its last known movement inside Iranian waters. An announcement on Iranian TV claimed the tanker had failed to respect international maritime rules. Its British operator says that's not true. London is now urging UK ships to stay out of the area for the time being. There is no alternative route uh, in and out of uh, the Gulf, so um, if, if this uh, is, is to endure, then clearly it is going to impact on uh, our trade routes, trade patterns and ultimately uh, the price of, uh, of those goods. The US president is rallying to Britain's support. We have a lot of ships there that are warships and we'll talk to the UK and we have no written agreement but we have an agreement. They've been a very great ally of ours. A second British-owned tanker, the Mezdar, was boarded by armed guards but has now been allowed to continue on its journey. Iran's actions are believed to be in response to this, the Royal Marines helping to seize an Iranian supertanker off the coast of Gibraltar earlier this month. Britain believed it was smuggling oil to Syria in violation of EU sanctions. Tehran accused London of piracy. A meeting of the government's emergency committee, COBRA, went on late into the night. The big question now, who will make the next move? Simon Jones, BBC News. Well, our correspondent Catherine de Costa is outside the Foreign Office for us now. Catherine, uh, since uh, the Foreign Secretary spoke to cameras late last night after that meeting, uh, he's put out another statement uh, as kind of tonally at least it seems to be slightly tougher in its message. Yeah, and clearly relations are deteriorating between Iran, the US and the UK. In a statement put out this morning by the Foreign Office, it says ministers met in Cobra to discuss the incidents in the Strait of Hormuz. We remain deeply concerned about Iran's unacceptable actions, which represent a clear challenge to international freedom of navigation. We've advised UK shipping to stay out of the area for an interim period. As the Foreign Secretary has said, our response will be considered and robust and there'll be serious consequences if the situation is not resolved. We remain in close contact with our international partners and there'll be further meetings over the weekend. When out this morning, Jeremy Hunt, the Foreign Secretary, has tweeted, he said, yesterday's actions in the Gulf shows worrying signs Iran may be choosing a dangerous path of illegal and destabilizing behavior. He added, our reaction will be considered but robust. We've been trying to find a way to resolve Grace One issue, but we will ensure the safety of our shipping. Now, Iran's take on this incident is that the tanker collided with an Iranian fishing ship and failed to respond to calls from that smaller boat. It's been taken to an Iranian port. All 23 crew members are on board and will remain so until an investigation is carried out. But the vessel's owner has said it was complying with regulations and was in international waters at the time. What about then the international reaction? Because presumably... Uh, Britain's relations with Iran are partly determined by the position the European Union takes. Yes, well, you will be clear that uh, tensions have flared earlier this month, and that was caused by the Royal Marines seizing an Iranian tanker that Iran responded, accusing Britain of piracy and threatened to retaliate. A week later, Iran tried to impound a British tanker. That was stopped by the Royal Navy. Iran's also... Uh, hurting from tough US sanctions. It may feel it's got nothing to lose. The US is trying to bring about an international coalition to condemn this situation and so far both France and Germany have called on Iran to release the British tanker immediately. Catherine de Costa at the Foreign Office, thanks very much. Let's speak now to the Conservative MP Chairman of the Foreign Affairs Select Committee Tom Tugendhat. Mr Tugendhat, good morning. Thanks for being with us this morning. morning Sean. What's your take on, on this situation and the prospects of de-escalation? Well, I think this is extremely concerning because what we're seeing tested is fundamentally the uh, system of rules that have kept us safe and prosperous for the best part of 
70 years. This is admittedly a British tanker that has been taken, but it could have been from any nation. And the truth is um, that we must stand together with our friends and allies to make sure that we resolve this uh, issue as soon as possible. So in a sense, it's less that it's a British flagged vessel, because in some ways that's a sort of a convenience thing, isn't it? It's more that the, the, the potential challenge it represents to free movement of shipping through one of the most important uh, links for commerce in the, on the planet. And that's exactly right. Look, for 200 years or so, the Royal Navy kept the sea lanes open and for much of the past 70 years, uh, other countries, most notably, of course, the United States have played their part too. But now it's time uh, that uh, the entire international community steps up as well, because a lot of the energy, in fact, most of the energy that's leaving through the Straits of Hormuz is actually turning east, not west. It's going to India and China, where those growing economies are demanding more energy. And so this is really a test of a system that we have built up and are now sharing with so many more. And that's why it's so important that the French and German governments have quite rightly come out in support of the UK, because today it's the UK, tomorrow it could be somebody else. The reason those Royal Marines uh, seized that Iranian ship was not because the British government wanted it, but because the international community demanded it. We have uh, strict sanctions on not uh, allowing resources or indeed fuel to get to the regime in uh, uh, Syria and to perpetuate that vicious war. Uh, in terms of uh, Iran's uh, reaction to that seizure of the, uh, the ship by the Gibraltar Coast Guard, I mean, their argument is that that effectively has interdicted the free movement of a vessel. Yes, it may be EU sanctions, but they're not UN uh, Security Council sanctions, and therefore, from their point of view, they're going to ignore them. And they would argue, why should they uh, comply with a view of a certain number of countries that oil shouldn't be supplied to Syria? It's a regime, after all, that is recognised by a lot of countries. Look, there's no question about recognising the regime. There is, however, a long-standing international principle, including uh, recognised by the United Nations, that you don't pour fuel on a fire. And uh, one of the things we do know about Syria is that it is a very vicious civil war, a conflagration in many ways stirred up by the Iranian Revolutionary Guard Corps, the same group that has seized the British uh, vessel and taken it to Bandar Abbas. And so, although, yes, you're right, these are EU sanctions, they are an expression of an international desire to stop a civil war in Syria that has seen tens of millions uh, of people uh, fleeing their homes, many of them internally displaced, but an awful lot of them externally displaced and causing refugee crises into countries like Lebanon, Jordan, Iraq and Turkey, not to, not to mention many European countries. So although you're right, this is a European Union uh, sanction and one that we uh, were instrumental in, in ensuring was put in place, this is actually about upholding the international order. And if we don't do it, then we're going to, uh, we're going to prove the, the, the old line that, that politics is simply history for slow learners. Yes, it's a good way. It's a good and powerful way of putting it. I suppose the danger, though, and the fear some people have is, is the kind of law of unintended consequences applied to a situation like this. And if Iran is simply testing us or going for us because it's easier than going for America and less risky from its point of view, isn't there a danger that even by the response we risk the kind of conflagration, creating the excuse, if you like, that the Iranian Revolutionary Guard then used to take other action that's potentially more serious, more damaging and more likely to lead to conflict in a highly combustible part of the world. That's, a, that's an extremely reasonable point. Uh, but the truth is the uh, IRGC, the Irre Iranian Revolutionary Guard Corps, is already now uh, encouraging uh, violent revolution and, and murder in Israel, Syria, Lebanon, Jordan, uh, Iraq, Bahrain, Yemen, Saudi Arabia. I can go on if you like. And uh, so talking about conflagration, yes, but let's not pretend that there isn't uh, an awful lot of violence coming from that regime today. Now, I'm not arguing in any way for a military response at the moment to, uh, sorry, a military response to the, um, to the seizing of this vessel. But I think we need to be very clear that the lessons uh, of history are absolutely uh, obvious. They are that if we allow ourselves to be bullied, whether our ambassadors or our, or our, our shipping or our military, uh, then it leads, to, uh, it leads to other examples. It, in fact, just encourages. So whether it's standing up for our ambassadors or making sure that Royal Marines aren't seized in the Persian Gulf, as they were uh, about a decade ago, 
uh, or indeed making sure that our ships aren't taken. Uh, we need to be absolutely robust because weakness just encourages uh, violence against us. Tom Tugendhat, Chair of the Commons Foreign Affairs Select Committee. Many thanks. Let's cross to Folkestone in Kent now where we can speak to the former head of the Royal Navy, Admiral the Lord West. Lord West, good morning to you. Um, what do you think can be most effectively done to protect not just British shipping but other commercial shipping through the Straits of Hormuz in this potentially very serious escalation? Well, I think we've got to the situation now where we have to convoy uh, merchant ships. I, I, I'm very, very surprised that although we issued a a warning to our merchant ships that this was a dangerous area and that they shouldn't go there, that we didn't sort of take the normal procedures for control of merchant shipping, take charge of uh, British merchant ships and say, right, you're not to move up through the Gulf, you're to go and anchor off Muscat or wherever it might be, um, and uh, wait until there were a group of them. And then even with only one frigate, we could have escorted them through to allow a ship to go up when we knew the Iranians wanted to actually take a hostage uh, is extraordinary it's, and it's hardly surprising they said they would do it uh, several times they said they would do it and lo and behold they've done it and now we've got in this very very difficult situation presumably we're in a more difficult situation than now because they've proved that they have the capacity to do this and we have to do something to uh, remove the threat without actually con a direct confrontation? Yes, I mean, clearly we want to de-escalate. Mm. I mean, nobody wants a war in that region. Um, but de-escalating doesn't mean that you don't do the first duty of a government, which is protecting its assets and its people globally as well as at home. And therefore, we need to ensure we are looking after British flag merchant shipping. And it seems to me we've taken a couple of very silly decisions about that. But looking at the future, it's not escal escalatory to actually look after our ships. They should be able to go through those waters. It's very important we reinforce the aspect that they're allowed to go through those international waters. And the way to do it safely, so we can stop the IRGC small boats causing any problem, is to do it with a small convoy, at a t uh, one at a time, with uh, a warship looking after them. And ideally, with another warship as well. We've got Duncan going out there. But actually, I have to say, some... Uh, three or four weeks ago, um, I did say, look, maybe we should be moving our assets out towards that region without escalating it, the great joy of naval ships. You could go through Suez, you could go on a visit to Mombasa, you could go down to Diego Garcia, but they would have then been closer, and we would have been able to call them in to look after our ships going through international waters, and that is not escalatory, I don't believe. That is something that any nation should be able to do. Lord West, thank you. Now let's. Well, our correspondent Catherine de Costa is outside the Foreign Office for us this lunchtime. Catherine, what's the latest? Well, we know that clearly rhetoric is going to play a really important part in how this is going to play out because Jeremy Hunt, the Foreign Secretary, has already ruled out using military intervention. He's hoping to use diplomacy instead. And this morning, the Foreign Office put out a statement, and in it they said, we remain deeply concerned about Iran's unacceptable actions, which represent a clear challenge to international freedom of navigation. We've advised UK shipping to stay out of the area for an interim period. It goes on to say that our response will be considered and robust and there will be serious consequences if the situation's not resolved. It goes on to say that there will be further emergency meetings here in London over the weekend. In addition to that, uh, Jeremy Hunt has been tweeting this morning and he said yesterday's actions in the Gulf shows worrying signs Iran may be choosing a dangerous path. He added our reaction will be considered but robust. We've been trying to find a way to resolve Grace One issue and will ensure the safety of our shipping. Now, Iran's take on it, according to a news agency in the country, is that the tanker collided with an Iranian fishing boat and failed to respond to calls from that smaller boat. It's now been taken to an Iranian port and all 23 crew members are still on board and they'll remain on board while an investigation is carried out. But the vessel's owners have said that it was complying with regulations and was in international waters at the time. We've also learnt that the tanker wasn't carrying any cargo. Catherine de Costa at the Foreign Office, thank you very much. 
while Mehmet Konsari is a former Iranian diplomat and a senior consultant at the Iranian Center for Policy Studies, and he joins me now on webcam from Spain. Uh, Mr. Konsari, thank you very much for being with us on BBC News. What do you make of the action that Iran has taken? Well, I think uh, Iran is playing a very huge, is making a huge gamble. It's trying to mix its public diplomacy ploys for trying to put its point across along with hardline uh, action on the ground uh, being carried out by hardline elements to show that they can match toe-to-toe, -to -toe, they can go toe-to-toe -to -toe with American action, aggressive action, or British aggressive action in this case, when Britain sees the uh, British tanker. And uh, uh, they want to show that that they are resilient and that they can uh, strike back and that they should they should their their rights and legitimate concerns should not be trampled over uh, however what they are doing and the method in which they are promoting this is obviously provocative and at a crucial time when they need european support in order to uh, stand up against american pressures well uh, actions of this nature seems to have a reverse effect. Um, we're just seeing some pictures as you were speaking there, Murdad, of the uh, boat uh, that has been seized. Uh, those pictures coming from the Iranian news agency. We also can't verify them independently, but nonetheless, the latest pictures they've put out. Is there a, a perhaps a, a quite deliberate uh, decision by uh, the Iranian Revolutionary Guard by, by going for a British flagged vessel? rather than a US flagged vessel? Do they, in other words, regard it as less risky to confront the UK than potentially confronting the United States? I don't think, I don't think that is the consideration. I think the consideration is that Britain had seized an Iranian ship in, the, in Gibraltar, and they feel that the uh, underlying reasons which Britain took in order to take that ship are as flimsy as the reasons they are giving for having intercepted the ship yesterday. So their action and their aim is to essentially go uh, tit for tat and hope that as a consequence of this action, Britain will release their ship so that they can release the ship that they have acquired and essentially put an end to episodes of this nature. I think this is the, main, this is the game plan that they have. Obviously, when you resort to action of this nature, you are uh, provoking a situation that could get out of hand and lead to all sorts of other consequences. However, they feel at the same time that there is very little extra, even for the United States, to be gained by some sort of a punitive military action against Iran in the sense that it engages the US or Britain into something with very little incremental gain for them compared to the gains that they are making as a consequence of the stringent sanction, sanctions regimes which they have already imposed. If you were going to, uh, you were in a position to uh, have the ear of the new incoming British Prime Minister who takes office on Wednesday of next week, what advice would you give him? My advice would be to try to work out a situation where the Iranian tanker is released as soon as possible and diplomatic gestures are made to Iran so that Iran and the UK refrain from actions of this nature at the behest of parties with other access to ground. Uh, Konsari, former Iranian diplomat, thank you very much for speaking to us this lunchtime. Good afternoon. The Foreign Secretary, Jeremy Hunt, has summoned the most senior Iranian diplomat in the UK to the Foreign Office after the Iranian Revolutionary Guard seized a British-flagged oil tanker in the Gulf last night. The government has advised UK ships to stay out of the area of the Strait of Hormuz for an interim period after a meeting of the Emergency Committee, COBRA, late last night. Well, state media in Tehran say the tanker, the Stena Impero, had violated international maritime rules, but the ship's owner, the Swedish company, Stena Bolt, 
says the tanker was in full compliance with all navigation and international regulations. Well, the Foreign Secretary Jeremy Hunt said that the seizure was unacceptable and Britain's response would be considered but robust. Paul Adams reports. Iran says the Stena Empero and its multinational crew, which does not include any Britons, is now being held at the port of Bandar Abbas. The authorities there say the tanker is being investigated following an accident involving a fishing boat. The ship's owners have not confirmed this and say no rules were broken. The Stena Empero was making its way through the narrow Strait of Hormuz in international waters when it was intercepted by a helicopter and several small boats. It made a sharp turn north towards Iran, its last reported position a few miles southwest of the Iranian island of Larak. We will respond in a way that is considered but robust and we are absolutely clear that if this situation is not resolved quickly there will be serious consequences. A second tanker, the Mezdar, was also detained, but only briefly. It's now making its way towards a port in Saudi Arabia. But concerns over the safety of shipping are rising. I don't think uh, the raising of tensions further is in anybody's interest. There will be no winners if that's the case. So we call for caution, we call for de-escalation, uh, so that uh, we can restore some sort of confidence and security uh, in the busy waters in the region so that ships and seafarers can carry on doing their business supporting global trade. Earlier this month, Royal Marines detained a tanker full of Iranian oil off Gibraltar. The Grace One was accused of smuggling oil to Syria in breach of EU sanctions. Iran called it an act of piracy and threatened to respond in kind. The tanker is still being held. I think they want their tanker and their crude oil out of Gibraltar because it's worth a great deal of money. They want to establish the position firmly that the United Kingdom is not seeking to enforce U.S. sanctions. Yesterday, Iran released these pictures, showing American warships sailing through the Strait of Hormuz. Washington said it had brought down an Iranian surveillance drone. Iran said the pictures proved otherwise. What they do show is a waterway crowded with military and commercial vessels. A fifth of the world's oil passes this way, and it's getting more dangerous. Paul Adams, BBC News. Well, Catherine, our correspondent Catherine de Costa is outside the Foreign Office where a senior Iranian diplomat has been summoned. Uh, so, Catherine, just what more can you tell us about this latest diplomatic move? Yeah, well, as you say, that senior Iranian di diplomat is due here at the Foreign Office this afternoon for a meeting with the political director. Now, that encounter is expected to be quite tense. Earlier today, the Foreign Office put out a statement in which it said it was deeply concerned by Iran's unacceptable actions and warned there could be serious consequences if the situation's not resolved. There'll also be another COBRA emergency meeting this afternoon to discuss how to proceed in such a volatile situation and Jeremy Hunt the foreign secretary is hoping to speak to his Iranian counterpart earlier he tweeted um, that um, that the Iran may be choosing a dangerous path and stressed the reaction would be considered but robust. Now clearly rhetoric is going to play an important role with how this plays out because Mr Hunt has already ruled out using military intervention. He's hoping to use diplomacy instead. And the US is trying to pull together an international coalition to condemn the situation. France and Germany have already called on Iran to release the British tanker immediately. Meanwhile, the British ships have been warned to avoid the area, um, but the threat to UK shipping in Iranian waters in the Gulf remains critical. Um, and Catherine, there's been a fair amount of international reaction to this as well. I mean, what options do they realistically have on the table if Jeremy Hunt has said that there will be no military intervention? Well, as I say, it's all about the words, it's the rhetoric, isn't it? Talking about me being clearly concerned and serious consequences if the situation's not resolved. Um, they're obviously hoping that this can be resolved peacefully by, by talking it, hence why there are so many meetings here, the emergency meeting with COBRA, um, talking to the Iranian counterpart, um, using words really to try and resolve this peacefully. Um, and, uh, and, and again, hoping to get 
the backing of the rest of Europe. Obviously, Britain and Europe are in quite a dilemma, quite a difficult situation. They're still signed up to the nuclear agreement. And they're going to be hoping that not to make the situation any worse and, uh, and, and to escalate what's already you know, a very volatile situation. Catherine, um, I just want to take you back to last week. We had some very emollient words via Twitter from Jeremy Hunt and his Iranian counterpart about the state of the Grace One tanker that Britain said had been heading towards Syria. Um, what happened to that? There, there had been words about hoping to resolve the situation quite quickly. Yeah, as I understand it, that tanker is still being held and Gibraltar has given it an extension. Uh, so that, 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 that was the situation you may remember where Royal Marines helped seize an Iranian tanker that was suspected of carrying uh, oil to Syria. That would have breached EU sanctions. Uh, so that's been uh, held up and uh, that extension has been granted. So that, that's still a, a situation unknown. Um, now, whether they'll use that as a negotiating tool remains to be seen. Um, and, and clearly it's about talking um, with their Iranian counterparts um, and uh, obviously as I say these meetings here later this afternoon to work out how to proceed what are their options if military uh, intervention is off the table. Okay Catherine de Costa in London, central London, thank you for that. Um, we're going to speak to our Middle East correspondent uh, Lena Sinjab now who's monitoring the situation from Beirut. Uh, so Lena we understand that the Iranian charge d'affaires has been summoned um, in London What's the latest reaction um, where you are in Iran, for example? Well, the Iranians have been clear about their message, uh, and even the Foreign Minister Jawad uh, Zarif uh, made it clear that uh, what happened is a violation of international maritime uh, regulations, which the uh, ship owners ha have denied, and they said that they haven't been involved in any violations of the regulations. But obviously, uh, for Iran, this is also a reaction to what the UK has done earlier this month with the seizure of their oil tanker, that the UK says that it was um, uh, intending to uh, transfer transport oil to Syria, which is a violation of the U.S. sanctions on Syria. The, uh, this is a big uh, uh, economic uh, burden on, on Tehran. They want their tanker removed. Uh, they want their tanker moved, uh, actually. And uh, they want their oil as well. Uh, Iran is uh, facing terrible economic situation with the sanctions, the renewed sanctions of the U.S. Uh, on them. And this is a, a leverage for them to negotiate and to uh, have a way uh, to uh, find the solution for their economic problem, but also to uh, treat the UK with a tit for tat after the seizure of their oil tanker early this month. Alina, it would appear that Iran really has uh, nothing uh, to lose now. Um, just how hard, you, you described terrible economic hardship, everyday life, just take us through what those sanctions are doing to Iranians. Well, it is definitely a difficult situation on an economic level, and we can, you can feel it also across the region where, where Iran is involved with other uh, countries like Syria and Hezbollah. The money is shrinking, uh, but also on ordinary life in, in Iran is becoming difficult for the ordinaries. Although you can get the sense of uh, defiance among people against uh, U.S. Uh, um, actions and sanctions on Iran, but of course there is a difference between uh, the people and the government, and also within the government there is the official government and there is the revolutionary guard, the hardline ones that uh, or was the one in charge of this uh, seizure of the British tanker today. Uh, so, but uh, the, the whole country is feeling the pressure of the economic sanctions, and uh, this action by Tehran today, as you rightly said, they have nothing to lose by pushing the boundaries and asking uh, for. Uh, you know, for an, an equal treatment and get their tanker released by the UK. Okay, Alina Sinjab, thank you very much for that. Okay, we're just going to bring you the latest reaction uh, to events taking place in uh, the Gulf, in the Strait of Hormuz. Um, we've had a response from the EU, the EU High Representative uh, for Foreign Affairs, uh, Federica Mogherini, has just sent a statement reading, the seizure of two ships by Iranian authorities in the Strait of Hormuz is of deep concern. In an already tense situation, this development brings risks of further escalation and undermines ongoing work to find a way to resolve current tensions. We urge the immediate release of the remaining ship and its crew and call for restraint to avoid 
further tensions and the statement ends freedom of navigation must be respected at all times so reaction latest reaction there um, regarding events taking place uh, in the Iranian Gulf well, our correspondent, Catherine de Costa, is outside the Foreign Office, uh, where a senior Iranian diplomat, ha diplomat rather, has been uh, summoned. And Catherine, in the last few minutes, we've heard from the owners of the, the, the tanker. What have they said? That's right. Uh, literally, in the last few minutes, the statement has come in, and it says our insurers in the region have been in contact with the head of marine affairs at the port of Bandar Abbas, who have reported that the crew members of our vessel Stena Impera in good health and that the tanker is at the nearby Banda Bonaha anchorage. The head of marine affairs has asked for a formal request to be made for a visit to be arranged to the crew and members and the vessel and I confirm that the formal request is being prepared. So that statement there in the last few minutes. And we've also heard a tweet from Jeremy Hunt, the Foreign Secretary. He said he's now spoken to his Iranian counterpart and he's expressed extreme disappointment that having assured him last week Iran wanted to de-escalate the situation, they've effectively done the opposite. He added that it has to be about actions, not words, if we're to find a way through. And he said that British shipping must and will be protected. Well, Iran says the tanker was violating international maritime rules, but the vessel's owners dispute that. And this afternoon, the Reuters news agency has been reporting that the tanker was escorted by a British warship, which tried to to prevent Iran from stopping it. Now, as you say, today a senior Iranian diplomat's been summoned here to the Foreign Office, and there'll be a further emergency meeting of COBRA here this afternoon. We're actually expecting to get an update from Mr. Hunt within the next hour. Now, what's he likely to say? Well, he has already said he's not considering military action, but he hopes to find a diplomatic solution. But the rhetoric is being ramped up. In an earlier tweet, he said Iran may be choosing a dangerous path of illegal and destabilizing behavior after Gibraltar's legal detention of oil bound for Syria, and is warned there may be serious consequences if the situation's not resolved quickly. But Iran is hurting from tough sanctions imposed by the U.S., and it may feel it has nothing to lose. Now, there's no time scale, no deadline set at this stage, no detail about how British shipping is to be protected. Clearly, though, Britain has to tread very carefully in an already fragile situation. Catherine, thank you very much. Thank you. So that was the latest statement there from Jeremy Hunt. We're now going to speak to our security correspondent, uh, Frank Gardner. Um, Frank, things really have escalated, haven't they? They really have. Um, this is by far the most serious incident to have taken place in the Gulf, coming on the back of a number of instances, the mining of tankers, the shooting down of a drone, and, uh, of course, the, the, the near capture, what it appears to be, of another British flag tanker only a few days ago. So the seriousness, I think, can be judged by the fact that we've just had a ministerial-level COBRA, uh, a cabinet office briefing room emergency session. Um, really, the British government's in a bit of a bind here because they don't have a great deal of options left to them. Um, what they would like to do is to have a firm international response, preferably done through allies, possibly with the UN. But this is a very volatile situation. It's quite clear that the Iranians are carrying out what they see as a tit-for-tat, they see this as, as a direct retaliation for the impounding of their vessel in Gibraltar. Now, that is not a straightforward case because that was impounded under what's called EU Serious Sanctions Regulation Number 36. Uh, the Gibraltarian Supreme Court has extended its impounding for 30 days, and there's going to be a legal wrangle amongst maritime lawyers over that. So both sides are accusing the other of maritime piracy. Frank, I don't know whether you've had a chance to see um, that video in full. Mm. I mean, we, we, we clearly see the name of the tanker um, with those uh, speedboats up amongst it. But there was a claim earlier that there was some sort of British escort, military escort at the time. Any idea whether this has been confirmed from the British side? I haven't heard that. This particular tanker was inbound. It was coming from the Gulf of Oman. It had gone round the Strait of Hormuz, the very narrow choke point, 21 nautical miles wide, and it had entered, just entered the Gulf. It was still in Omani territorial waters within the 12-mile limit. 
um, and it was then diverted north towards the port of Bandar Abbas. I've been three times to Bandar Abbas. It's a huge, big, sprawling it's port. It's Iran's main Gulf port with a big container terminal, and it's also home to a major Revolutionary Guards Corps naval base. They've got submarines and other stuff there, um, and they've got naval ports all down that coast. So it's a, a very congested area. But this tanker was empty. It was heading towards the Saudi port to take on oil. So it wasn't taken with fuel on board. It was, it was empty en route. This is the first time something like that has happened. I'm just talking through the possibility of a resolution. Um, obviously, we've had these statements from uh, France, uh, Germany, and the US have also, President Trump has also said that uh, a level of support would be provided. Is this something that Iran would, would take seriously? Because they've taken quite a gamble here, haven't they? And yet, it appears that Britain is still going for that diplomatic route. Yes, I mean, it's a really tricky one, this, for Britain, because the big picture here is that Britain and its European partners, France and Germany, are not on the same page as the United States when it comes to the wider policy of dealing with Iran. Why? Because the nuclear deal, which was put together very carefully with the help of the Obama administration, has been essentially torpedoed by President Trump withdrawing from it last year. The European nations are trying very hard to keep Iran in the deal, um, and there's talk of possibly some way around this, but Iran is really suffocating under the heavy US-imposed sanctions, so that's the backdrop to this. All of the actions that we've seen in the Gulf since then are a response by hardliners in Iran who may not necessarily be informing, what the, informing the elected government what they're doing. You have to think of Iran as two Irans. There is the front-facing front of house, President Rouhani, Foreign Minister Javed Zarif, all of those people that you see in front of the cameras normally and who do, do the normal business of diplomacy. Then there is the deep state and the Revolutionary Guards Corps, which is something of a law unto itself. It answers directly to the National Security Council and to the Supreme Leader, Ayatollah Ali Khamenei. And there are people in the Revolutionary Guards who are quite prepared to push this right up to the brink of a conflict, but probably stopping just short of it. Frank, um, thank you for that. Uh, yeah, fast developing situation. I'm sure we're going to be talking to you again over the weekend. Thank you. Tensions started to rise last year when Donald Trump pulled the US out of a 2015 nuclear deal with Iran and imposed crippling sanctions. Iran grew increasingly frustrated. In May and June, it was blamed for a series of attacks on international tankers. Then, in a dramatic escalation, Iran shot down an American surveillance drone. Donald Trump briefly contemplated a military response. And earlier this month, off Gibraltar, the Royal Marines intercepted a tanker full of Iranian oil Britain said was bound for Syria. Iran threatened to retaliate. Today, Iran's foreign minister accused Britain of piracy. It is Iran, he tweeted, that guarantees the security of the Gulf and the Strait of Hormuz. The UK must cease being an accessory to the economic terrorism of the United States. The Stena Impero and its multinational crew, which does not include any Britons, are now prisoners of Iran's Revolutionary Guard, hostages in a deepening geopolitical row. Paul Adams reporting. We can speak now to John Green, who is Director of Development at the Global Seafarers Charity, Stella Maris. John, thank you very much for joining us. Tell us more about the work that your charity does, first of all. So we're the largest seafarers welfare charity in the world. In just over 300 ports, we've got teams of chaplains who will visit ships to look after both the practical needs of seafarers, transport ashore, helping them to get in touch with family, but also to um, provide emotional support for them in times of difficulty. Tell us how this latest seizure of a vessel in the Gulf will be affecting other seafarers in that region. Well, it's not only uh, other seafarers. Uh, when we think of the uh, crew on board this ship, immediately one comes to mind their family, their children back home, and the huge amount of worry that will be um, going for, through the families as well as the, the crew on board. What, um, it's the situation of the crew that's particularly tragic in, in this moment, that in, in the middle of an international conflict, seafarers are being exposed to military actions that have nothing to do with their professional work. What are the protocols for a crew on board a vessel that finds itself in this situation? 
Well, this, this particular situation echoes the piracy crisis of Somalia about 10 years ago. And um, not only for, for those ships that themselves were affected by the pirated attacks, many seafarers coming through the region on other ships that weren't attacked, actually they were going to be a lot more worried. So um, similar pr protocols. And what we saw in the piracy crisis there was the uh, escorting of vessels by warships, ships travelling in convoys, that did a lot to reduce um, piracy attacks in that occasion. But if it happens to you, if people do board the vessel, be they pirates or, as we've seen in, in this instance, um, masked men descending from a helicopter, what is the advice to a crew? Well, it's, this is one of these situations, really, that I think crew, crew can be very unprepared for. Seafarers tend to be very resilient people, but uh, the, the, the tragedy here is they're, they're caught between a geopolitical um, conflict um, that they may or may not be prepared for. So let's hope that everything works out fine. They get back to shore. How does your charity help? So in situations like this or where there are other, there's other difficulties, maybe somebody's died on board or there's other problems on board, where our port chaplains in subsequent court ports will be waiting for this ship and for this crew to dock there and we'll provide them with emotion, emotional support and uh, a debrief alongside what the company may want. It's going to be a very stressful time for them, but not only for them, also remembering their families. So back in the, the labour supply countries, we also stand ready to help seafarers in any, and their families in any form of difficulty. And what form does that take, that kind of support? Well, it can be professional counselling, but also very much just standing alongside the family at this time um, helping them to get accurate information about what's going on. Um, it's going to be a, a long process and a long journey, both for these seafarers and the family, I suspect. John Green from the seafarers charity, Stella Morris, thank you very much for talking to us. Thank you. Paul Adams there. Well, Iranian political analyst Sayed Mohammed Morandi has told the BBC how he feels about the British Foreign Secretary's comments condemning Iran's seizure of the tanker. I think most people in Iran would be saying in response that he should have felt this way when the British Navy took an Iranian supertanker at the behest of the U.S. government and most probably Bolton. This is, of course, what the Spanish foreign minister said at the time. The Iranians believed that that was an act of piracy. It was completely unnecessary. And the Iranians believed that the British government, because of their problems with Brexit and their hope to have some sort of economic deal with the U.S. on favorable terms, that they are abiding by uh, U.S. requests in such a manner. But at the end of the day, the British can't hope to have a positive role to play in our part of the world, but at the same time abide by the demands made by Trump or Pompeo or Bolton or whoever else is in charge in the White House. The Iranians expect the Europeans to behave differently from the United States and to stop this escalation. The U.S. threatens Iran with uh, obliteration. The U.S. sends drones over Iranian airspace. The U.S. is engaged in economic warfare. It has surrounded the country with military bases. I think it's quite clear which side is carrying out the escalation. Sayed Mohammed Morandi there. Speak now to Rear Admiral Chris Parry, who's a former Royal Navy Warfare Officer. Good evening. Thank you very much for joining us. Not necessarily the question you're expecting from me, first of all, but can you just briefly explain what a Warfare Officer does? <laughs> uh, warfare Officer is probably the um, primary uh, specialisation that a Seaman Officer has in the Royal Navy. Uh, he conducts, uh, essentially, the fighting capabilities of a warship or an aircraft. Uh, and in any ship like HMS Montrose, you would have two warfare officers and more than likely the captain would be a warfare officer as well. So you would be, somebody in that role would be involved potentially in the kind of uh, operations we're seeing in the Gulf? Uh, undoubtedly, and as I said, there, there'll be warfare officers in Montrose. Captain is a warfare officer as well, and they are well practiced and well versed in what they have to do to fight their ships. What are the differences, as far as you're concerned, between the activity in the Gulf by Iran at the moment compared with the previous incidents of piracy we've seen off Somalia? 
Yeah, that's a very good question. Um, I frequently say that the C is the physical uh, manifestation of the World Wide Web, and everything that goes virtually on the Internet really goes by C. Uh, and I tend to see things like the Iranian action and the pirates off Somalia as the sort of malware that gets in the way of everybody doing their business at sea. Uh, and in that sense, the Iranians are playing piracy just like uh, the pirates off Somalia in the Straits of Malacca, anywhere else in the world where people seek to uh, obtain illicit ends uh, by illegal means. What choice then, given the importance of the Straits of Hormuz, do ship owners have but to send their vessels along this stretch of water? Well, you're quite right. It's a really important uh, uh, international strait. That's why it's protected by international law to stop uh, people like the Iranians actually interfering with that traffic. Uh, and I think we need to be really clear about this. There's no moral equivalence between what happened off Gibraltar uh, and what happened in the Straits of Hormuz. Um, the Iranian tanker was arrested, quite rightly, in EU waters uh, for conducting, essentially, illegal sanctions busting. Uh, what has happened uh, in the Gulf is part of a pattern, I'm afraid, right the way back to uh, the 1980s when the Iranians, whenever uh, they have internal problems or they want to gain something from the international community, they tend to put pressure uh, on the shipping in the Gulf. And this is essentially what they do. Uh, and it's the sort of behavior you expect from a rogue nation with a regime that is tottering uh, and really is being held to ransom by the Iranian uh, Republican Guard. And I think what's really interesting here is that this sequence started uh, when the Grace One, the tanker, was arrested off Gibraltar. Uh, and that's a very important part uh, of the economic uh, activity of the Iranian Republican Guard, because this paramilitary organization actually controls about a quarter of the Iranian economy. And so this is hurting them really very much indeed. And because of that, it's not so much the issues associated with the nuclear deal. The Iranian Re Republican Guard are putting pressure on their own government and trying to advertise to the world uh, that they can be trouble if they're not looked after. You say that they're being held to ransom by the I Iranian Republican Guard. That, that sounds like you're implying that they're acting uh, on their own, that they're not being instructed by the state to do this. But I'm not implying it, I'm being absolutely explicit about it. I think the Iranian Republican Guard are actually running the country at the moment. Uh, and uh, I think uh, you'll find that the recent Trump sanctions particularly targeted the Iranian Republican Guard. They don't like it very much. Uh, and we don't hear very much from the government in Tehran. We hear a lot from the Supreme Ruler. Well, of course you do, because the Iranian Republican Guard actually acknowledge his authority. Um, but in fact, uh, the Americans have to play a very careful game here. Because in trying to uh, deter uh, the Iranian Republican Guard, uh, they're also uh, destabilizing the Iranian regime uh, in Tehran. Um, it, it, Tehran is in a very, very difficult position at the moment. The country is under severe economic sanctions. Uh, the people obviously are restless. Uh, about 70% of the population are under 35. They want the sort of things that you and I have in the West, and they're not getting it. So uh, it's a very fragile situation in Iran at the moment, and this is not making things any easier. It was only a couple of weeks ago that um, President Rouhani was appealing in particular to France to say, come on, let's try and keep this deal, this nuclear deal together. We don't want it to unravel. So how mindful should the White House be at this moment that if it pushes too hard, things could get a whole lot worse? Well, I, I think um, it could get a whole lot worse within Iran, that's for sure, because the Iranians have to have something to take home to their people. And one of the things they won't want to do is lose face. And I think one of the uh, complicating factors in what we're seeing in the Gulf at the moment is the Iranians are really keen to embarrass Britain. Why? Because we've got a change of prime minister coming up. Uh, we've got a foreign secretary, of course, who's part of the leadership race. And it's all timed, of course, to try and embarrass us. Uh, and uh, I think that's got to be played into the mix as well. But I think we shouldn't be any doubt here. Uh, the Iranian action is a clear threat to um, uh, the passage of shipping through an international strait, which is protected by international law. And if the Iranians do it, other people in the world will get the idea that this is a good idea as well. It isn't. And we need to protect the rules-based international system on which global security and our prosperity depends. Rear Admiral Chris Parry, thank you very much for talking to us.
Well, Mike Singh is Managing Director of the Washington Institute and former Director of Middle Eastern Affairs at the National Security Council. He's in Washington for us. Mike, thank you very much for your time. Is there a diplomatic way out of this for the UK? Well, Richard, uh, it's a very difficult circumstance because you have so many different issues which are mixed together. I, I think that um, the first concern that the UK will have is going to be, of course, for the ship and its crew. Um, and I'm sure they're already engaging in quite intensive diplomacy to try to win their release. Uh, and I'm sure that Iran is probably connecting that to their own tanker, which uh, was uh, seized by the British in the Strait of Gibraltar a couple of weeks ago. Uh, then you have sort of the, the issue of trying to deter the Iranians from uh, doing this sort of thing again. That can't really be done diplomatically. There the UK will have to look to, say, increasing its uh, naval patrols of the Persian Gulf uh, or doing something to give the Iranians the impression that there's a cost to this type of action. Well, when you say something, what do you mean? Well, you know, I, I think it's, as I said, you could beef up patrols, but it may also be that the Royal Navy will have to be a, a bit more aggressive in confronting uh, Iranian vessels uh, that approach British uh, shipping. So, you can't simply turn off shipping. You know, so it's, firing. Uh, you think you think that it might come to firing on an Iranian vessel? Well, that obviously would be sort of the last resort, I think, for any professional navy, whether it's the British or the American. Um, but you can, of course, you can escort the tankers uh, more closely. You can, you know, fire warning shots. Uh, there are a number of steps up the escalatory ladder that you can take before it comes to sinking a ship. Uh, on the diplomatic uh, side, one British newspaper is reporting that the UK is considering new sanctions, it's considering asset freezes. Is something like that going to work? Well, I think the complication here is that it gets mixed together with the broader tensions between especially the United States and Iran. Uh, and the British have, in fact, been looking to, to de-escalate that. They, they've urged, in fact, Washington uh, to perhaps step back from some of the pressure they've placed uh, on Iran. And so the real question, I think, now for London is, can you sort of punish Iran for this latest action without sort of abandoning that policy tack that you had been taking towards the overall situation? I, I think that will be quite difficult. Uh, but, uh, on that point, isn't this just forcing the UK closer to the US, forcing the UK to work with the US on a policy it doesn't even agree with? Well, I, th I think that uh, people in Washington are hoping so, you know, that this, in fact, will be, uh, from the United States perspective, a wake-up call for allies uh, about sort of the nature of the Iranian regime and what's at stake. Um, but I think Iran is sort of hoping the opposite, that, that where what this will lead to is stronger calls from Europe, from London, uh, to the United States to change its policy because of the tensions uh, that have resulted in, this, in the Persian Gulf. All right, lots of sides to the issue. Mike Singh with the Washington Institute, thank you very much. Thank you. That was Tom Bateman, our Middle East correspondent. How are these latest tensions going to affect shipping in and around the Gulf? Let's talk to Guy Platten, Secretary General of the International Chamber of Shipping. Guy, uh, good to speak to you again. We spoke yesterday morning and of course events have moved on since then. Um, what sort of calculation are companies now making about the risks of using the Strait of Hormuz? Well, good morning to you, and uh, good to speak to you again. Companies will, will take a, make a risk assessment for, for every trip and voyage they make, but particularly now, obviously, with these heightened tensions, they're going to be looking very carefully about whether uh, they take cargo to and from through the Straits of Hormuz. At what point does that start to have a direct economic impact on the, on the costs? Well, the, the, uh, the costs have already escalated uh, uh, tremendously because now in order to actually to make the transit at, at all, you have to declare to your insurance company and those premiums have gone up fourfold since the attacks last month. So there's a, a direct cost to, to shipping straight away. And of course, ships have to follow best guidance. They have to be in close contact with their flag um, to uh, and follow any instructions from that as well. So um, there's, a, there's a huge uh, sort of program of involvement in trying to to assess whether to take the cargoes or to, to make a safe transit. And let's also remember that the most important thing of all is the safety of the crews. Mm. Just on the, this question then, uh, uh, and safety is part of this, uh, the British government warned uh, several weeks ago about the potential risks uh, in the light of those attacks that had been on tankers in the Gulf. There was then the incident involving the Grace One being seized and concerns about uh, how Iran would react to that, whether there would be a tit-for-tat 
retaliation. It's acknowledged uh, in some of its official commentary out of Iran that this is partly provoked as a retaliation, although they say it was a, uh, some sort of incident involving a fishing boat. So they've given us two explanations for seizing uh, this vessel. But in the light of all of that, was it wise for the Stenet Impero to be going through the Strait of Hormuz in the first place? I think we've got to, to remember the Strait of Hormuz is an international waterway. It's guaranteed by international law. Ships will be able to have the freedom of navigation, the right of instant passage. So it, it's, you know, there's clearly risk assessments. There's clearly precautions that we take on board the ship. But it, it is, we think fundamentally, it is an international waterway. And ships have a right of passage. And just in terms of it being an international waterway, is there something now where you would like to see perhaps the United Nations uh, becoming involved to ensure that all countries recognise their obligations, not just to for safety, but also uh, for the security of the commercial traffic and the crews who operate those ships. We certainly be working on all authorities and urging all authorities now to de-escalate the situation. Freedom of navigation is a fundamental principle of international law and their ability to, to, to safe and innocent passage through these internationally recognised uh, waterways is, is absolutely fundamental. Um, and uh, that, that we, so we, we are working with our colleagues and, and others to keep, continue to make this case. And let me ask you finally then, uh, one simple uh, pr uh, solution to this has been suggested, that the two governments simply hand back each other's ships. I, you know, I'm, I can't comment on the politics of all of that. All I would say is I would urge all sides involved in this to, to work together to uphold what is a fundamental principle of international law, which is the freedom of navigation. And we look forward to a, a swift uh, release. And, and we must never forget that there's 23 crew members and 23 families who must be desperately worried at this time. Guy Platten, Secretary General of the International Chamber of Shipping. Thank you very much for joining us again. Thank you. The new Prime Minister will have to deal with is the problem of the uh, Stem Inerco, the uh, ship which was seized by Iranians uh, last week and uh, which is still being held by them. A recording has emerged of dramatic radio exchanges between a Royal Navy warship and Iran's Revolutionary Guards moments before uh, they stepped on board the British flagged oil tanker in the Gulf. The Stena Impera was boarded on Friday in the Strait of Hormuz, a key shipping route. Foreign Secretary Jeremy Hunt has urged Iran to release the vessel and its crew. Iran's ambassador to the UK has tweeted warning the UK government against escalating tensions, saying it would be quite dangerous and unwise at a sensitive time in the region. This report from Ramzan Kamali. The seizing of the British flag tanker, the Steno Impero, by the Iranian Revolutionary Guard. Tehran says the ship was breaking maritime rules. The owners of the tanker insist it was obeying international law. The British government has condemned Iran's actions. We are calling on Iran to reverse this illegal act. Uh, we're looking for ways to de-escalate the situation, but we're also very clear that we will do what it takes to ensure the safety and security of British and international shipping. The tanker was intercepted as it made its way through the Strait of Hormuz in Omani waters. It made a sharp turn north towards Iran. You obey, you will be safe. If you obey, you, be, you will be safe. After your course, that was the message from Iran to the Stena Impero. This dramatic audio recording emerged, which appears to show that the British warship, HMS Montrose, did try to stop the seizure of the tanker, but it was too far away to physically intervene. Stena Impero, this is a British warship, Foxtrot 236. Sir, so I reiterate that as you are conducting transit passage in a recognised international strait, under international law your passage must not be impaired, impeded, obstructed or hampered. Please confirm that you are not intending to violate international law by unlawfully attempting to board the... The Foreign Secretary will update MPs on Monday about what further measures the government will take. But the threat level has been raised to the highest level of alert. Ramzan Karamali, BBC News. Well, earlier our Middle East correspondent Tom Bateman gave us the reaction from Fajara in the United Arab Emirates. Well, I think it's leading to increased anxiety here in the Strait of Hormuz. And you can hear in that tape the radio exchanges between the Royal Navy frigate and uh, the Iranian patrol boat out in the waters here. Uh, just how tense these moments have become because that ship, the, the British warship, was racing towards the Stena Impero, trying to, in effect, protect it, defend it, but unable to reach it 
uh, in time. So I think there is a sense of concern that continues among, particularly of course among seafarers here. And what we have now is that crew of 23 from the British flag tanker who left Anchorage here in Fujairah on Friday expecting a pretty routine voyage west to a port in Saudi Arabia, now due to spend their second uh, full day off the coast of Iran in the opposite direction uh, with yet another day of uncertainty about their fate. Tom Bateman reporting from the UAE. The UK junior defence minister Tobias Elwood was asked by Sophie Ridge on Sky News this morning whether London was considering putting sanctions on Tehran. So our first and most important uh, responsibility is to make sure that we uh, get a solution to the, the issue to do with the, the current ship, make sure other British flagged ships are safe to operate in this, uh, this waters, and then look at uh, this wider picture of actually having a working proper professional relationship uh, with Iran. But this is a hostile act. Let's not uh, dodge away from that. This is a serious matter for which uh, Iran um, must, uh, must recognise. When you talk about de-escalating tensions, uh, does that mean sanctions and things like that are off the table? Well, we will, uh, COBRA was taking place yesterday, so we're looking at the operational responsibilities from that. But the, yes, the, we are going to be looking at a series of options. But let's also make it clear that this is international waters that we're speaking about, uh, the, uh, a critical geostrategic uh, pinch point in the world. And we are committed to do our role on the international stage to to keep these waterways open and therefore we need an international solution so we'll be working speaking with our colleagues our international allies to see what can actually be done well our middle east correspondent tom bateman joins us now from fujara in the united arab emirates uh, tom the uae one of those countries that has caused to be nervous about any deterioration in relations between iran and other countries like britain and the united states what's been the regional reaction to the uh, seizing of the uh, Br uh, British flagged ship. Well, there's been a great deal of anxiety because, of course, remember it uh, comes right at the heart of those two uh, great uh, uh, poles of, of power here in the Middle East, Saudi Arabia here on the Arabian Peninsula and Iran just across uh, the Strait of Hormuz here. This has been a jittery time, not just in the last week, but of course in the last a uh, couple of months or so uh, where people here have been looking across the Gulf and wondering at some points whether a you know, military conflict may have been about to happen. That was uh, last month when uh, even Donald Trump said that he was close to launching a retaliatory strike against the Iranians when they shot down a US drone in disputed circumstances. So I expect that we'll hear more of the, the same sense of concern uh, about this, although it doesn't have at this stage the kind of military dimension that I think we had in that standoff between the US uh, and the Iranians earlier in the month and last month, because this has much more been uh, about, I think, a sense in which Iran is trying to strike out economically to show that it has uh, the power to do that. It sees this very much as a retaliatory move uh, against the fact that uh, Royal Marines uh, raided uh, a tanker carrying Iranian oil uh, off the coast of Gibraltar earlier this month and that ship of course is still being held. How big an impact is this dispute likely to have on the commercial exploitation of the Strait of Hormuz? Because we are continually told that it's one of the most important sea routes in the world. Yeah, well, British flagged vessels have been advised by the British government to stay away for the time being from the Strait of Hormuz. Having said that, I mean, the number of British flagged vessels that use this waterway is actually relatively very, very small compared to the overall uh, number. There's a fifth of the world's crude oil supplies that pass through here. But in terms of British flagged vessels, at least, uh, you're talking probably one to two transits uh, per day. So it's quite hard to tell at the moment whether it, the advice by the British government has had a, a real impact, but my sense is from the shipping industry that any major shipping company is going to be taking that advice very seriously if it has any kind of British interests uh, on a vessel. So I expect we might see uh, some ships changing their manoeuvres, uh, changing their journeys or at least staying away uh, for the time being. I think the sense is for the wider shipping industry so far it's likely to have uh, less impact. That being said, things like insurance costs for ships to pass through here have been going up and up ever since the tensions uh, got underway here a couple of months ago.
Tom Bateman, thank you very much. Uh, Tom Bateman, there, our uh, Middle East correspondent in Fajara, that's in the United Arab Emirates. Well, we're going to cross live to Dorset and speak to Henry Jones. He's a journalist who specialises in defence and international security. Hello there, Henry. Lovely to join us here on uh, BBC News. Just first off, just to summarise you know, the latest comments that have been made, Philip Hammond has said that the, we already have a raft of sanctions against Iran, so it's unclear um, what we can do in the immediate future. Tobias Alwood has said that um, there needs to be an international solution. So how do you see um, this being resolved and who internationally is willing to come on board and take on Iran? So the first thing I think to say uh, is the UK is not necessarily keen uh, to, to join a sort of coalition just with the United States uh, to solve this. Uh, it was reported uh, earlier today that that had been on the table last week uh, and, and the, the London concern is that it's subsiding with the US over this and allowing them to help us uh, through the situation sort of almost validates uh, the US position on the nuclear deal. So that's the first issue here. Uh, how, how you get through it uh, is, is a difficult question for London to answer. Um, a number of options have been drawn up. Uh, as Philip Hammond said, sanctions are on the table. Uh, Tobias Elwood uh, there as well. Uh, and I understand that uh, military options have been drawn up. Uh, last week, uh, the understanding is uh, the Ministry of Defence presented uh, a whole raft of options uh, to, uh, to Downing Street, uh, and, and they need the green light, they need to go ahead uh, from their political masters to do that. Uh, and so it's now up to, uh, if this is going to be resolved, uh, it is now up to the politicians to decide how to do that. Uh, and if that involves the military in the region, uh, that, that will be their call to make, uh, and they will no doubt enact that. Well, um, Admiral Lord West has said that more needs to be done. There has been a call for more investment in the Navy. Um, how re realistic do you think it, it could be for military escorts to accompany tankers through the Strait of Hormuz? It's, it's not inconceivable. Um, you know, Lord West is entitled to his comments. I think it's, it's worth adding that the UK has a very significant uh, permanent presence uh, in the region. Uh, it has its, its fawn for uh, mine hunters, it has HMS Montrose, it has HMS Duncan en route. Uh, there are other there are Royal Fleet Auxiliary ships uh, again en route. It has a substantial presence in the region. Uh, it, it needs, you know, what, what I, I'm not entirely sure I buy this idea that we lack the capability to protect our shipping. Uh, we have this sovereign capability to protect the shipping. Uh, what more needs to be done? Uh, I think it is it's hard to say. Uh, but, but, but say we, we, yeah, we, we lack a capability to protect the shipping it is, is not particularly helpful. Um, and yeah, as, as, as you mentioned, um, there is this prospect that we can have uh, convoys uh, moving through the strait. Mm. Um, we can have you know, set times where the 30 British flag ships uh, that pass through, the, pass through the strait every day, mm. they can go through at a set time, they can be escorted, etc. Um, but that, that's difficult mm. to achieve. Um, Henry, uh Iran earlier described what's taking place as reciprocal actions, hinting that this is just uh, tit for tat. I mean, surely it's really not as simple as that, is it? This is brinkmanship. How far do you think Iran is willing to go? I, I, I think I, I agree. I agree with you that this is it's, it's not as simple as this is just tit for tat. Uh, you know, uh, 4th of July, uh, we, uh, well, the Royal Marines uh, walked off the coast of Gibraltar, seized uh, the Iranian tanker. Um, and uh, hasn't yet been released. Uh, and, you know, they, they can argue that it's just a retaliation for that. They can, they can, they can spin it however they like. Um, and, of course, they're going to spin it how it benefits them. Uh, they have an agenda here. Um, I think uh, an interesting point to make is, is what Iran wants to get out of this um, uh, and how, you know, their actions, the, the precedent that their actions set. Um, you know, if, if they can get away with this, if they can seize a British flag, flag tanker in the Strait of Hormuz, uh, that was exercising innocent passage, that it was going about its usual business. If they can do that, and if they can get away with that, it sets an incredibly dangerous precedent, uh, not unlike uh, the precedent that has been set in the South China Sea by China, um, you know, flouting uh, international law upheld by the United Nations. OK, Henry Jones, thank you very much for that analysis. Thank you. OK, just to bring you the latest reaction to this, we've just had a statement um, from the tanker camp, uh, company that runs um, the Stena Impero. Um, so uh, the president and chief executive of uh, Stena Bolt, Enric Hanel, has said that uh, I can confirm that a formal request for permission to visit, visit the 23 crew members of the Stena Impero has been made to the authorities of the port of Banda Abbas.
where that tanker is being held. Now, the request has been acknowledged, but we await a formal response. In the meantime, we will continue to cooperate and liaise with all appropriate authorities. Just to remind you, um, the 23 crew members are of Indian, Latvian, Filipino and uh, Russian nationality. So as and when we get more on this, we will bring it to you here on BBC News. The time is just coming up to 20 past two. A reminder of the headlines this afternoon. So Mike Pompeo dismissing that. Here's Donald Trump also dismissing it just a short time ago. Uh, let's see what happens with Iran. We are ready for the absolute worst and we're ready for sense too. But we are very geared up and uh, if they, they, are, they are really the number one state of terror in the world. So it's a complicated situation. To wrap all of this up for us, here's our international correspondent, Lise Doucette. The essence of this crisis with Iran does go back to last year, with the United States unilaterally pulling out of the Iran nuclear deal, which has led to these crippling sanctions, including preventing Iran from selling its oil. And it is bringing us to where we are now, which is this rising tensions in the, the Persian Gulf, this critical waterway for, for oil supplies. Jeremy Hunt, though, has ma was making it clear that the Britain and other signatories to the Iran nuclear deal did not agree with the United States decision. It very much wants to try to rescue that deal, even though many people say it's, it's all but dead now. But when it comes to the principle of freedom of navigation in the Persian Gulf, they are at one with the United States in saying that we have to protect the tankers. Although he has made it clear that they are not going to join a U.S.-led effort to improve maritime security. Instead, what he's announced today is that there will be a European maritime mission. He talked about all the European leaders he's been speaking with. So even there, Britain and other European allies are saying, we do not agree. We do not want to be part of the U.S.'s maximum pressure on Iran. We want to find a different way forward. Well, thanks to Lise Doucette to talk, for talking us through that. It's a complicated situation. We'll continue to monitor that on outside source. The captain of the tanker carrying Iranian oil held off Gibraltar after being seized by British Royal Marines has told the BBC's Tom Bateman that his crew has been caught up in what he called a political game. The captain, who's an Indian national, spoke on the condition of anonymity. He says the force used to detain the ship was unnecessary. They came up to the bridge and uh, I asked them, I'm the captain, uh, what do you want? They just pointed the gun and they started shouting, look forward, look forward. I said, I'm the captain, tell me what do you want? They just didn't listen to me. No, I was totally shocked. I didn't know what to feel because they didn't give me a chance to talk. They didn't care whether I was master or nobody, nothing. There was no regulations followed. We are 28 unarmed crew, uh, then when the, you know, I was in a state of shock. Everybody was in a state of shock. I was trying to talk to them. They were not communicating. And when you say no, reg when, when you say no regulations were followed, in what sense? Yeah, I mean, how do you come on a ship like this with armed forces and with such uh, brute force? For what reason? Okay. Do you... Uh, You've suspected the vessel is carrying oil. All you need to do to arrest a ship is the harbour master comes on board or sends, he says, Captain, give me your certificate file. You have been arrested. That's all that needs to be done. I don't know why so much force was used. Uh, I don't understand. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Press TV's News Review pro Program. That is where we get in depth in one of the day's top stories. Let's go. And now, UK Foreign Secretary Jeremy Hunt has called for the release of British flagged oil tanker, the Stena Impero, which was seized by Iran on Friday. Uh, we need to see the illegal seizing of a British flagged vessel reversed. We need that ship released and we continue to be very concerned about the safety and welfare of the 23 crew members.
Now Hunt was speaking after holding a telephone conversation with Iran's Foreign Minister Mohammad Javad Zarif. During the call, Zarif said that Iran's action in regard to seizing the tanker is legal as the vessel violated maritime regulations. He urged the UK to stop being, quote, an accessory to economic terrorism of the U.S. On Saturday, Iran's Islamic Revolution Guards Corps released footage showing how Stena Impero was captured. The IRGC says tanker was seized while uh, sailing into the Strait of Hormuz through a wrong pathway. It added the vessel also turned off its transponder and risked accidents with other ships. Meanwhile, Iranian citizens have reacted to the seizure of the British flagged oil tanker in the Strait of Hormuz, as well as the U.S. claim of downing an Iranian drone in the area. They say the West is provoking Iran into a conflict which will not be in the favor of anyone. Let's take a listen. I think that the IRGC Navy's reaction was legal. There's no problem with what they did, and we support it. We should not be coerced by force, and it is not rational to let others do anything they want and tell them, OK, you have the right. We should definitely counteract and defend our rights. I think Trump's claims were made for his own citizens only, and this is no authenticity because the IRGC perfectly explained and showed that our drone was safely flown and returned. This is for their own public opinion, and I don't think it has any other reason. And because Trump's popularity has decreased, he wants to raise it with these claims. They are always the ones starting disputes. If our tanker was not seized in Gibraltar, Iran would not have done any of these. I think this conflict will reach an end in the near future, because Iran has issued a decisive message. It has issued a mutual encounter by seizing the English oil tanker. I think that the countries of the West and England are the ones who will suffer the greatest loss from creating insecurity in the Persian Gulf region, because it is their economic interests which are being fulfilled in the region. And now joining us for this news review is Daniel Lazar, journalist and author out of New York, and Mr. Dennis Small, political commentator, joining us out of Leesburg. Gentlemen, I want to welcome you both to the program. I guess we'll start there in New York with you. Mr. Lazar, your thoughts on all this? Well, I think the, uh, the U.S. Um, does behave unilaterally. Uh, uh, on one hand, it pays uh, lip service to the idea of international law, but then on the other hand, it's an empire. And uh, in an empire, the emperor... Uh, in this case, uh, Washington, uh, his word is law. So, uh, so the U.S. Uh, uh, believes it's entitled to behave uh, in an exceptional manner. Uh, it's uh, not obliged to obey the rules uh, that others must obey, uh, and so therefore, it's, uh, it's it's um, it holds that that it's entitled to a unilateralist uh, foreign policy. And why has Britain gotten itself involved in this? Well, Britain is a very is a is a country in an extreme crisis due to a uh, to Brexit. The government is very weak. Uh, it's uh, it's a uh, always takes its signals from uh, the United States, and now it's especially eager to do Washington's bidding because it's so insecure and so unstable. And uh, your thoughts on all this? Your initial thoughts that as Mr. Dennis Small. Well, I think that the uh, Team B, to which Minister Zarif has referred to uh, many times in the past, we need to add one more B, uh, in addition to Bolton and Bin Salman and Bibi and so forth. And that B is probably the most important one, and that is the British. The British are actually playing a central role in this whole thing, as they have from the very beginning. The whole string of provocations, if you look back to the strategic nature of them, beyond simply the latest Iranian ones, which are transparently provocations just on the surface of it, sailing without a transponder. I mean, this is exactly what uh, the Ukrainians did in the Kerch Strait incident uh, for the purpose of trying to create a conflict with Russia. But if you look back to what happened all the way back to Libya, the assassination of Gaddafi, then look at Syria, uh, the role of the White Helmets, which should probably be called the Whitehall Helmets because of their control out of London and the provocations there. This is all part of a strategic chess game. And the British are, in fact, a major player in it. And Washington is more of a battlefield than a government because there are different views in Washington. Uh, Bolton, Pence, Pompeo are 
100 percent on the British line. Trump, in my view, is seeking for a different type of alternative, uh, often very influenced by those other players. But you can see that in what he has done with this initiative around Rand Paul to try to find a discussion topic. I think the immediate crisis in Iran didn't, or with Iran, didn't develop because of anything in Iran. It developed because Trump actually did meet with Xi Jinping and did meet with Putin at the G20 meeting despite every effort imaginable by the British and others to stop this from happening, including Bolton. And if you look at the uh, circumstances around the affair of the ambassador, now former ambassador of the UK to the United States, uh, Sir Kim Darroch, you can see that what he was doing was not only attacking President Trump, that's uh, par for the course, but he was flagrantly saying that we have to try to stage an incident in the Middle East, possibly with the death of American servicemen, to try to get a war started between the United States and Iran. And I think that's the hand of the the puppeteer behind the most recent developments. And do you think the, the British feel some kind of entitlement to the Middle East? You know they've been here for a lot longer than, than the Americans have, and you know they had a strong presence in Iran. They still have a strong presence in the region. And at, some, at one point, uh, the colonial Brits were here making all the decisions for the Middle East. And do you think somehow under their skin they want to get back to those glory days for themselves? Yeah, certainly. I mean, Sykes-Picot and all the rest of it, it goes way, way back. That is that is the case. Uh, they have functioned in large measure, especially since the death of John F. Kennedy, with the idea that American muscle would be used to further British geopolitical aims. I would refer you to the frequent speeches by Henry Kissinger in that regard at Chatham House and elsewhere, where he said that he coordinated his policies uh, with the Foreign Office uh, more directly even than he did with his own colleagues in Washington. So yes, I think the British definitely have everything to fear. Brexit does have a lot to do with it. I agree with my colleague what he said before, principally because this threatens the entire financial system, as well as the political situation, which the Brit British otherwise run out of the city of London. So their system is in a serious crisis. And part of their policy, as it always has been with the British, is when in doubt, start a glorious little war and see what can be done under those circumstances. They're trying to do that around Taiwan. They're trying to do it in Hong Kong. They're trying to do it in Iran. They're trying to do it in Syria. They're trying to do it in Venezuela. It's a global pattern, which is in response to a global strategic situation. And you know, Mr. Lazar, that uh, super tanker, the Iranian super tanker off Gibraltar that the, the Brits grabbed, supposedly Spain's uh, uh, Madrid said at the, at the request of Washington, and now, what was the pretext for that? They said that they felt there were arms on board headed for Syria. They had uh, British commandos and, and naval uh, commandos raid the ship. They found no arms. But guess, guess what? They still uh, pretty much extended for another 30 days seizure of that ship. Okay, so that's completely against maritime, obviously any kind of international law. So what, or what position does Jeremy Hunt have now to demand that Iran release this oil tanker here in the Strait of Hormuz that, that tran turned off its transponder and drifted off route? Well, he obviously has no, he has no position whatsoever. He's, uh, he's, he, uh, he, he's been uh, backed into a corner by Iran. Iran has, uh, has retaliated uh, and the British have no possible response. They behave illegally, therefore they have no basis for criticizing Iran's actions. But let me, let me say one thing is just make one thing very clear. Um, it's not Britain that's calling the shots. It's the United States. It's a U.S. empire. Britain's role is entirely subservient. Um, and, uh, and to try to reverse that relationship is completely unrealistic. Uh, it's Washington, which is waging this war against Iran. Uh, Trump has been in vain against Iran since the moment he announced his uh, presidential candidacy in June 2015. Uh, he, he has vowed from the beginning to tear up the nuclear accord. Now he's following through. Uh, he's allied himself very closely with the Saudis and the Israelis, all of whom want a confrontation with, uh, with Iran. So uh, this is entirely Trump's doing. He did it all by himself. I mean, others have had a helping hand, the Pats, the British, etc. But the entire but the responsibility uh, in the main lies with Trump. But time and again, Trump has said, I don't want regime change in Tehran. I don't want a war with Iran. Just why 
are there so many contradictions in his actions and his rhetoric? Because Trump doesn't know what he wants. He has no idea what he wants. He just simply, he, he came out against the, uh, against the nuclear accord when it was first negotiated in 2015. He's been attacking it ever since. Uh, for, and he's doing the bidding of the Saudis and the Israelis. Uh, he doesn't want a war, it's quite true. I mean, Trump is a bully who doesn't want to uh, get into a real fight. But forces he set in motion are pushing him, him off the edge of a cliff. And I think a war is increasingly likely. And Mr. Dennis Small, your final thoughts there, please. Well, I think that in, in if one hopes to actually change what's going on in the world as opposed to simply comment on it, you have to look with a little bit of more refinement at what's actually happening in the United States and Washington. Uh, look at it with the eyes that intelligently uh, President Putin looks at it, look at it with the eyes that Xi Jinping looks at it, similarly Assad, even the Venezuelans who are really have their back up against the wall. And if you look at the developments in the United States, the fact of the matter is that the long-standing Anglo-American establishment around the intelligence agencies, including the British, MI5 and MI6, have been trying to overthrow the Trump government. Now, I'm not supporting Trump's policies in all of these things. What I'm saying is that as with the Brexit vote in London, as with the situation in Italy, there is a process that was unleashed with the United States elections that caused the establishment to be caught completely off guard. And so what they have done is they have deployed a lot of their forces inside Washington, such as Bolton, such as Pence. And as I said, Washington is a battleground. It's not black and white. Uh, it's fortunately more nuanced than that, which means that foreign actors as well as domestic actors have more that can be done in this. I think that what Trump did in his meetings with Xi and his meetings with Putin is the right direction. And both, like I said, Putin and Xi Jinping have been intelligent enough to know the nuances here. And I don't know what it's going to lead to. It's in fact not even confirmed yet. But if there was, in fact, a meeting between Rand Paul and Iranian authorities, I think that's positive and moving in the right direction. The big fight is the one that has to be won, which is those that would drive the world to war, including nuclear war, between the United States and Russia and the United States and China. And that's the situation that we're dealing with. Gentlemen, I want to thank you both for joining us and for the contribution for the program. Daniel Lazar, journalist and author out of New York, and Mr. Dennis Small, political commenter, joining us from Leesburg. And viewers, that's a wrap for the segment of your Press TV's News Review. Thanks for joining in and goodbye for now.